All right, seeing the presence of a quorum, we'll call this meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.01. I'll just note that we are being recorded, but not live broadcast by Amherst Media. Um, so a couple of uh, administrative notes at the top here. So I'm chairing this meeting today as vice chair uh, with our chair, um, Sir Jonius, uh, not available. And we are here to go immediately into update the MSBA statement of interest vote. So to explain why we are back here after having already approved this. So um, after our unanimous approval of the statement of interest, uh, Superintendent Morris and the chair presented the results of the vote and the listening sessions to the uh, town council on, on the 18th, I believe it was. Uh, very well received, um, a lot of appreciation expressed for that work. Um, and there were some, uh, a few friendly edits uh, that were submitted uh, to help strengthen the sense of urgency in the applications and uh, clarify some items. And so, <coughs> Uh, in order to consider those changes, we need to uh, review that and uh, revote the statement of interest. Um, so that's what this is for. Uh, in addition, statement of interest requires approved minutes of the vote. And so we also have approving the minutes for this item. And so because we are going to be approving the updated MSBA vote, but not the full meeting, uh, there's particular language that Ms. Westmoreland has provided to me so that we can do that. And so. The plan is, is that after we have our discussion and vote, uh, Ms. Westmoreland will display the, uh, the minutes. We'll be able to review them, and then we'll vote that, a test that those are an accurate reflection of, uh, of our vote. So uh, procedurally, that's where we're at. Um, so in terms of, of the changes, so uh, Dr. Morris sent us the electronic copy of the three or four minor changes uh, that he worked on, uh, along with Mr. Roy Clark, I, I would imagine. Um, and so we've had a chance to review that. So I'll, I'll just go through those quickly, identify what those are, um, and then have a brief statement from uh, Ms. Ordonius that she wanted me to, to read, um, and then we'll open it up for comments and questions. Right, any, any procedural questions there? All right. So, um, so there was a typo on one of the pages, very minor, that was fixed. Um, there's a revised description of the capital process that was based on some feedback from the town council. Uh, some revised language to focus on the urgency uh, and the consensus that has been built, uh, also from the Town Council. And uh, also some uh, added language about the building envelope from a school committee member. Um, before I read Mr. Jones's statement, uh, Superintendent Morris, is there anything you want to add in terms of framing or context of that? Um, I think the only thing I'll share is that I appreciate the feedback we received and I think it strengthens the document and also shows how I, I experienced it as uh, a partnership. And that's how Ms. Ardonius, Chair Ardonius framed it. And um, partners sometimes can say, hey, this could be better. This strengthens it. And so I appreciate uh, the level of detail and feedback and commentary that we received at the town council. All right. So the, uh, just a brief statement from Ms. Ardonius reads, uh, I appreciate the time and effort that Dr. Morris and Mr. Roy Clark have put into preparing and revising these statements of interest and that the committee has put into review reviewing them once again. I also appreciate the friendly edits recommended by the town council last week made in the spirit of cooperation. Our acceptance of these edits tonight will provide further evidence of our district's good faith efforts to engage the council and the community in this process now and in the future. I'm optimistic that our final vote on these SOIs tonight will set us on a positive path forward that ends with a successful application to the state. Um, I couldn't have said it better myself, so I personally have nothing to add. Uh, open up for any questions or comments from the committee. Okay, seeing none then, I would entertain a motion, uh, the full text of which, so we'll have two motions, one for, for Irvin Wildwood, uh, text of which is before you. Yes, Mr. Nakajima. I move that the Amherst School Committee approve the following, Rural River, resolved having convened in an open meeting on March 26, 2019, prior to the closing date, the Amherst School Committee, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority uh, the statement of interest dated March 26, 2019, for the Fort River School located at 70 Southeast Street, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Priority 1, replacement or renovation of a building which is structurally unsound or otherwise in a condition of seriously jeopardizing the health and safety of school children where no alternative exists. Priority 5, Replacement, renovation, or modernization of school facility systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating and ventilation systems to increase energy conservation and decrease energy-related costs in a school facility. 
Priority 7, replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements. And hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting the statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitments from the school, Massachusetts School Building Authority or commits the Amherst Public School District to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. McDonald. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion has read, raise your hand signifying aye, and it is 4-0 unanimous. Okay, is there a second motion? Okay. Ms. Fitz? <laughs> sure. I move that the Amherst School Committee approve the following. Resolved, having convened in an open meeting on March 26, 2019, prior to the closing date, the Amherst School Committee, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest dated March 26, 2019, for the Wildwood School, located at 20, excuse me, located at 71 Strong Street which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Priority 1. Replacement or renovation of a building which is structurally unsound or otherwise in a condition seriously jeopardizing the health and safety of school children where no alternative exists. Priority 5. Replacement, renovation or modernization of school facility systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating and ventilation systems to increase energy conservation and decrease energy related costs in a school facility. Priority 7. Replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting the Statement of Interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance of the or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the Amherst Public School District to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Ms. McDonald, second. Any discussion or questions on the motion? Again, seeing none, uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand signifying aye. And we are unanimous again, 4-0. Okay, so that, those are the motions. Uh, in terms of approving the item uh, for the motions that we have just had, um, Ms. Westmoreland, do you need some uh, time or the, your furious fast fingers to I'm ready whenever Dr. Moore blaze away there? <laughs> okay. So the, uh, the recording of our motion into the draft minutes will be displayed on our screens presently. So of course it breaks across two pages. <laughs> um, I'll put it on the MSD. since that's what you're taking the motion on tonight. Folks can tell me when they're ready for it. Get out of the way. Okay, okay it's also behind us if you're uh, straining to read. Good to scroll on. <coughs> Please scroll away, sir. Miss <laughs> mm -hmm. Westmoreland, I'm, I'm assuming that for the core text of the motion that was provided to us in the printing is identical to. It what is. They had. Yes. What you read was copied and pasted right. from. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so uh, I have the motion to approve this item. If anyone would like to read it, Mr. Nakajima. Okay. I move that the motions as shown in the draft minutes are a true record of the votes taken by the Amherst School Committee to approve the MSBA SOIs for Fort River and Walden Elementary Schools and accurately reflect the meeting of March 26, 2019 until 6.09 p.m. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Ms. McDonald with the uh, trifecta of seconds yes. this evening. <laughs> uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand, signifying aye, and it passes unanimously 4-0. Okay, so uh, our meeting with the joint meeting with Palatman Region will commence at 6.30, and so uh, I would say we could either sit here and discuss the motions that we just did, or we could recess until 6.30. Uh, I'm imagining recessing would be appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. seeing nodding heads, uh, we stand recessed at 6.12. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. So the new one. Uh, seeing the presence of a quorum, I uh, call to order this meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee, and I'd invite the other chairs to do so as well. Seeing presence of a quorum, I'll call the Pelham School Committee meeting to order. Uh, seeing the presence of a quorum, I will call the Amherst School Committee back to order. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, so we have two items on our agenda, uh, both regional facility master use planning presentation as well as also uh, an update on uh, changes to the math curriculum at the secondary level uh, and the sixth grade. And uh, one thing I would like to offer uh, if the co other committees and the members of the regional committee uh, are in agreement is to offer an opportunity for, for public comment uh, at the beginning as well because for those people who came, and I guess I'll say specifically for the regional facilities master use presentation um, because there's, it's gonna be a while and it's possible that people might not want to be staying all the way through math if they came for the first. Is that agreeable? It is agreeable, okay. Uh, so what we'd like to do is open up uh, for public comment. Uh, you have up to three minutes. If there's a public comment, please come forward to the microphone and identify yourself. I should also mention uh, that this meeting is being filmed by Amherst Media for future broadcasts. Seeing none, we will close public comment. Um, but the, luckily, there'll be an opportunity at the end if uh, <coughs> people have ideas that come to them during this uh, process. Um, and, and just at the beginning, um, one of the things we've been trying to do with the regional committee, anyway, is try to outline what our expectations are for items, um, which help frame the discussion in the sense of what we're trying to accomplish and what we're going to uh, are asking ourselves to do as as a committee. And um, so, for the regional facility master plan, master use planning presentation. We're going to get a, a, essentially a final presentation from the consultants who've been developing the facilities plan for uh, the district. I think we could assume that at the end of the presentation, we might hear from the superintendent his thoughts on what next steps might look like. And But if also, if I'm correct, you were planning and handling this. You have other presentations recently where you want tonight to be about the present, the consultants work, but you look forward to sharing recommendations in the future? That's exactly correct. Yeah, so that limits hopefully and frames the discussion we're going to have tonight that it would be mostly on what the consultants are doing and less on what our next steps are as a, as a district. Uh, and we'll talk about math when we get there. So would you like to offer any introductory comments? Yes, um, I'll be brief because, again, as Chair said, I'll, I'll speak more at the end of the presentation. But um, I really just want to offer some thank yous um, and then and then queue, queue up um, our folks from JCJ. So the first thank you is the committee. I think the advisory board concept that was talked about at the regional committee really worked. Um, it worked. We had a nice, diverse group of people, from, you know, families to staff members at the elementary level, staff members at the secondary level, um, and, and that was a really healthy process. Uh, I want to thank a number of advisory board members are here tonight. So they really did. The reason that first thank you is important is because it really did shape the process, and, and certainly Ms. Cassinson can if she'd like on that, but but that every meeting we had, we went back, including last Thursday, we went back and there was significant feedback. So the 500 some odd page document that was sent to you last Thursday morning is going to be different than the 500 some odd page document that's the final version uh, because of the feedback as recently as last Thursday. Um, and I really want to thank the consultants as well for you know doing 
significant amounts of work and very condensed time frame as we requested. So I want to thank them. And, and as the chair said, at the end, I want to share some initial comments um, about next steps uh, based on some consensus that I heard from the advisory board. It wasn't a voting body, but certainly uh, it was a very um, robust discussion. Um, perhaps to come back for a more full discussion of next steps at a future meeting. I don't know if Ms. Kassin said anything you'd like to add. Yeah, I, well, I'd like to say um, thank you, too, to everybody, to the folks from JCJ and to the advisory board. Um, I wanted to say, I'm, this is the first time I've done anything like this on school committee. I was really impressed, um, particularly with the level of community participation and with the insightfulness and, and knowledge and intelligence a lot of people on the advisory board. I mean, it was a really um, organic process, I feel like, what happened. And there was a lot of good um, give and take. So it was a great thing to be a part of. Thank you. Yeah. So with us tonight is Jim Hoagland and Doug Roberts from JCJ. And they're welcome. And you're welcome to come up. And I'll just, just cue me when you want me to click the slides forward. I'll be happy to do so. Again, I'm Doug Roberts of JCJ Architecture, principal with our firm. Thank you for having us here this evening. Um, we are going to bring everybody up to speed of why we were uh, working on the uh, study and the steps that we've uh, covered since we were last in front of you back in January. Again, Jim Hoagland is with us as well. He's our senior designer. He'll be leading you through the uh, uh, design discussion. So, Mike, if you want to move forward. <coughs> Uh, next slide, if you could, please. Again, uh, I think when we were before this board in January, we had 10 meetings planned. Uh, as Dr. Morris indicated and uh, Mrs. Kastensen, it was an organic process. Things changed. It evolved. So ultimately, we were going to have a total of 12 meetings to complete our work here. Uh, and um, again, we talked about the advisory board uh, as well as the working group that was uh, representatives of the uh, uh, school committee, the district, faculty, uh, the feedback was um, very, very much gave shape to the project and was uh, very much valued by us to help us to uh, pull together the report. As things changed through the course of the process, when we were before you in uh, January, we were using demographic data or enrollment projections from NESDEC that uh, we use as the basis of design. We were looking for the, uh, the peak period of uh, student enrollment, which at the time, based on the data that was available, was 20, uh, academic year 2021-22. On March 11th, they published an updated report. We worked through that. <clears throat> what you notice on the screen in front of you is highlighted in the, uh, to the right in red are the numbers that changed in that report from the work, uh, the report that we had in January to what we received in March. Analyzing those numbers while they changed, they did not have an impact on any of the planning. So again, we wanted to demonstrate, or incorporate the information because it is current. We don't know when these projects, if they'll be moving forward at any time soon. We want to make sure the final report has the most up-to-date information in it when it goes to press. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Jim Hogan to talk you through the design. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I have a couple of options we're going to run through. And this, this was part of that organic process through the advisory board. Um, we, we received a lot of feedback on, on the diagrams that, that we had originally um, put in front of you. I, I believe when we were in front of you in January, we had some hand sketch drawings and you know, it was kind of big picture thinking. As we really kind of drilled down into the options and tried to understand how the buildings would accommodate the different programs, um, everything seemed to come into focus. So um, we ultimately looked at, uh, I don't even know how many options for each of the buildings. Um, I'm going to run through five options that we looked at we, we thought were very realistic for the middle school, and then three options for the 7 to, through 12 grade configuration fitting into the high school. Um, just to orient everybody, the, uh, the site plan, um, the, the building and the site obviously go hand in hand, and many of the options that we looked at, pulling sixth graders into the middle school, we talked about things like how would we accommodate the sixth graders, do they have more of an elementary school recess, um, so a lot, that, that was the level of discussion that we really got into. So as part of the exercise, we tried to identify a number of line items that we could attach cost to as well. So this site plan really just applies to all the different options that, that we looked at for the middle school building, taking into account some of the security protocols that we're talking about at the main entry, um, improving upon um, possibly um, 
um, accommodating or, or providing an outdoor play area, an additional play area on the hill up behind the school, as well as some of the some of the options um, actually moved central office around and did some renovations. So we looked at what that new entry would look like. Um, so what would you hit the next one? So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, I have five options here for the middle school. I'm going to try to get through them pretty quickly, and we can certainly come back to them if, if we have specific questions. Um, option one pulls all of the sixth graders into uh, the existing middle school. And from a design standpoint, we had some discussions about trying to isolate them a little bit from the seventh and eighth graders. Um, so we tried to find some space on the first floor of the middle school where the existing art rooms are, the business office, as well as um, the existing um, main office for the middle school. So in this scenario, we proposed moving the central offices back to where the existing wood shop is, which is a somewhat underutilized space within the building. Um, that would facilitate their own main entry off down that end of the building, um, but it freed up enough space in the first floor where we felt we could accommodate all those sixth grade classrooms along with the special ed programs that needed to be integrated with that. Um, and then it would facilitate um, renovating the existing uh, superintendent's uh, central <coughs> office to the new main office for the middle school and a new secure entry down at that end of the building. Um, why don't you go to the second floor? The second floor really became kind of a relabeling exercise, so we reconfigured the seventh and eighth grade teams on the second floor, um, trying to group them all so that we could get the English, social studies, math, and science rooms together and working as a, as a true middle school team. Um, so you can see how some of the special ed programs were sprinkled in with the 7th grade and the 8th grade. Um, the other big move here was moving the art classrooms, which are currently on the first floor, up to the second floor. So some of the bigger spaces at the front of the building on the second floor are currently science labs. Um, we felt it would be a good fit to move some of those art spaces in because they really do need a little bit more space. There's also plumbing that exists in those rooms and we think it would be a much more efficient, a, a cost effective renovation to move art classrooms into those spaces. So option two um, looked a little bit differently. Um, some of the people on the, some of the folks on the advisory board were trying to push the idea of how can we make this a better building? How can we better support a middle school um, framework of learning? So in this scenario, we actually started to carve out some small areas from corridors and spaces we were trying to find within the building so that we could create more of a, a breakout space for each and every one of the teams. So you can see here, there, there's a couple of open spaces um, between the sixth grade teams and the cafeteria, which would act as pullout spaces. Students could actually go out there and work on projects. Um, specialists could come and work with students in something that was more than just a hallway. Um, and the, the rest of the floor uh, is essentially the way I described option one. Um, you can also see the difference on the second floor where at each of the corners of the building we're starting to de develop those breakout spaces. Um, it necessitated a lot more renovation to the building and it actually drove some of the costs up. Doug's going to highlight some of the costs. Um, but we felt it, it was worth exploring uh, just from an educational philosophy. Um, it, it, we thought it was appropriate for middle school learning. So the third option actually backed up quite a few steps and we said, well, what if we got away with as little renovation as possible? Um, and option three, we, we actually kind of ran through and is truly a relabeling exercise. There's, there's almost no renovation work. We're not taking walls down. Um, you could almost get away with doing all this renovation at, at a zero cost. Um, there, there are implications with some of the ADA uh, reports that are out there, um, but we think maybe we can deal with those as, as capital improvement projects. Um, so the big thing here is it keeps LSSE in place where it is currently in the building. It keeps the main office where it is, the central office where it is. Um, so the first floor essentially remains exactly the way it is. Um, what's that? At, oh. Yes, and, and the, one, yeah, the one move on the first floor would be the professional development space would be turned into the theater room, which is currently up on the second floor. But once again, essentially a relabeling exercise. So the second floor, um, you can see now we have relabeled that whole back wing to accommodate the sixth grade. Um, it, it, just by the function and uh, organization of the building, it actually isolates them into 
their own wing. And uh, there, there would essentially be no reason for the seventh and eighth graders to have to travel back to that part of the building and cut back and across. So we think it's a nice way to use the building organization to isolate those sixth graders. It'd be a nice transition to, the, to their middle school experience. Um, but this relabeling exercise proved to us that we could accommodate all of the classrooms necessary for the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade at this level. Can I jump in for just a quick second? Certainly. I think it's worth noting from a process perspective uh, that uh, at the second advisory board meeting, there was a lot of feedback from members of the advisory board about noting um, could we better optimize space, uh, and, and they couldn't be here tonight, um, but um, met the next morning with um, the two the middle school co-principals and actually Wendy Kohler, who was a principal of the middle school in the um, <coughs> 1990s when the school had uh, well more many more students than would be in this model um, and was a three grade level model because until the 1998 expansion here there was a time where there was this was the middle school was a seven eight nine junior high school. I'm looking at Audra just to I was here. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I want to thank Ms. Kohler, who retired in 2008, for getting a cold call on a Thursday night and saying, sure, I'd love to think about this with you, uh, and really being able to work through it. But really, the origin of that came from the advisory board feedback, and then we added that advisory board meeting, as was shared earlier. And, and I think that iterative process is, is how we got to multiple options uh, for consideration. So, sorry to interrupt, but I think the process yep. piece is worth sharing. Yep, that's great. And I think right around that time, we also did a tour of the building. That's so right. the advisory group walked through the building, much like Mike said he did, um, and they saw a lot of the same things that, that were observed uh, and had conversations. So I think for the advisory group to be able to walk into those, you know, certain rooms and see how they were being used and how we were anticipating using them, relabeling them, um, I think everybody was able to visualize how it would work. So the fourth option I'm going to show you is really just a, a variation on option three. Um, there were a number of different um, program elements that the advisory board spent quite a bit of time discussing. Um, we had originally identified a number of spaces that we felt were underutilized within the building and we kind of targeted, the, targeted those. What kind of programs could we move into those spaces? How could we make them work a little more efficiently? Um, so option four, we, we began to break some of these options out. Um, there, there were essentially three items that we almost um, turned into line items. So option four um, takes into account the secure entry, and it would just be a renovation at the front door, which would provide a new vestibule, a new access point into the main and uh, main office, as well as secure um, cross corridor doors within the hallway, and also some consideration to the stair that currently goes directly up to the second floor. Um, so we'll, we'll highlight some of the the budget items and what we think that may cost as a single line item. So. Option four is really option three plus the secure entry. Then option uh, four, the second floor, is exactly like option three. So if we jump ahead to option five, the only difference here is uh, taking advantage of that underutilized existing wood shop and turning that or part of it into a maker space. That's one of the program elements that, that we heard was, was lacking at the middle school right now. We think that's a, a good use of the space. Um, there, in, in that space, there's more than substantial power space in the area. Um, we think that's a fairly easy renovation. Um, so option five does that. And this, the second floor remains exactly as it did in option three and four. Um, I think all the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, we, we did have some pictures that we ran through um, that we had <coughs> shared with, with the advisory board as to what that renovation could look like in the makerspace. You can probably just run all three of them through all three of them fairly quickly. Um, these are all spaces that JCJ has done recently. Um, with maker spaces, and you can see the connectivity between different spaces um, and, and the, the programs that, that you could accommodate within there. Then the next space, um, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the internal classrooms. On the second floor at the middle school, um, there, there's about six classrooms right now that currently do not have windows. Um, so as we walk through, the advisory group said, how can we get natural light into these? Um, and we, I think I, I can think of only one project that JCJ has worked on where we've actually put 
light tubes into classrooms, internal classrooms. Um, but this is a classroom where they, they've introduced um, at least nine of these light tubes, which would um, bring natural light into those internal classrooms. What's a light tube? Um, it is actually, um, it, it is literally a light tube. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's almost, it almost looks like a piece of ductwork that gets attached to the ceiling. There, there's a big lens that sits within the ceiling, and then there's a reflective um, piece of ductwork that runs all the way up to the roof, above the roof, and then there's a very small domed um, lens on top of the roofs to, to allow that natural light in. Um, and we, we think because one of the um, capital improvement projects is a new roof at the middle school, we thought it was wise to have the discussion now. So if it is something that might be desired to the school, um, I, I think we need to incorporate it now and incorporate it into the thinking of, of the re-roofing job. Just be a little ahead of the, the thought process there. Yeah, and, and we did look at a couple of different options. Um, some bigger skylights, which would actually bring in a lot more daylight, um, but with the existing structure as it is in that roof, um, you have joists that are awfully close together, and, and I don't think that we'd be able to incorporate large expanses of skylights. Um, we think this is a, a cost-effective solution, um, So, and, and we've created line items within budget, so I think it'll give everybody an idea as to the expense for, for that. So at this point, I think Doug wants to run through some of the, the costs for each of the options. Could I, I just have a clarifying question. So um, option, option five, is that option three plus the makerspace or option four plus the makerspace? It, it would be option three plus the makerspace. So and minus the secure entry. Yeah, okay. yep. you, you, could, um, you can look at the secure entry and the makerspace as single line items. You could combine those two. We could call it option six. You could add. So, and we, we've set up the budgeting that way, the estimating. So you could actually add those together, come up with an option six and do the makerspace and the secure entry. Okay, thank you. I think the think budgets part. are making their way around. Oh, yeah. Right. So, <laughs> if you're reading and along. And also, if it doesn't, it, I just, it's, good, it's a good moment to bring up that. My, do you want to take questions when you're done with one building before you move to the next building? Or I think we should. It? If that doesn't if impact that makes the sense time. To me. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense to me as okay. well. Cool. So. Uh, but again, I think part of the confusion is I see a number of you are reading the 500 page document or <laughs> excerpts from the document <laughs> and as this project uh, process has evolved the uh, option descriptions that are in the 500 page draft do not align with what we're presenting tonight because again we have received commentary from the advisory board as of last Thursday so we have tweaked the presentation so that is why we have distributed the updated budgets that have been prepared by uh, AM Fogarty um, Associates there in Dartmouth Massachusetts and uh, independent cost estimator. Uh, we work with them on a number of school projects, so they're very familiar with the cost of school construction in the Commonwealth. Uh, I want to focus the primary uh, discussion on the left two columns, because what uh, our planning to date is very conceptual. So we really haven't designed so much as we planned. So at this level of uh, estimating, uh, estimators typically look at the cost per square foot of a described level of construction. So that's how these estimates were developed for this uh, study. And you'll note that there are categories on the left-hand column that start with minor renovation, uh, paint, uh, ceiling tiles, just minimal impacts. Uh, major renovations, you're tearing down walls, you're putting in new ceilings, you might be relocating some plumbing. New construction, it'd be ground up. Uh, includes foundations, it includes structural members, it'd be new mechanical systems. Uh, you'll also see a line items for a new sprinkler system. We know that the existing middle school has about 2,000 square feet of the facility as a sprinkler system. The balance of the uh, school does not. Tied with that is a new fire alarm system. So again, some of the scenarios based on what the Massachusetts State Building Code would require, if you have uh, renovations that uh, total more than 7,500 square feet, that's going to trigger the requirement to bring the uh, building up to full code fire alarm and sprinkler system. So we wanted to capture those as cost items so that we evaluated these different design options. You then to total all of that and you get a total direct cost. So essentially that's the cost of the materials, the cost of the labor to install those materials, put them in place. 
then you add to that design contingency. As I said, we're planning right now. Uh, we know that, for example, in a major renovation, we'd have to improve the building envelope so that the building would meet the energy code. We haven't yet designed what those systems are, but at this level of estimating, we assign a per certain percentage, 15% design contingency, accounts for those design items that we don't as yet have, have, have not as yet defined. In addition to that, we assume a project of this nature would have a construction manager in it involved in terms of the complexity of it, phasing, uh, tight schedules. That's something that we would recommend. <coughs> Again, worst case scenario, you could have a general contractor execute the work as well. So there may be some savings there. But again, if we're trying to paint a, a realistic picture, we wanted to provide, um, I, dare I say, a worst case option, but um, a, a conservative estimate as to uh, what the realistic cost might be. The next line item, typically when you're budgeting projects like this, because they're going to be built in the future, you want to add a level of escalation. Material costs do go up over time. Because we don't know when these projects, if and when they'll ever be executed, we've only allocated one year of escalation for this discussion. On top of that, you then have the cost of the construction, which are the general conditions, the general requirements, building permit fees, uh, bonds, insurance, and oh yes, the uh, profit for the contractor. So that arrives at your total construction costs. We also realize that there are costs to the town or the region to actually facilitate these projects. So we have owner soft costs. That includes things like the architectural fee. If you have an owner project manager involved, their fee, the professional fees that would be involved. There are often legal costs that are assigned to these projects. There are testings and inspections. So again, early conceptual design we recommend carrying about a 25% markup to cover those costs to deliver a realistic budget for each of these different design scenarios. Um, so again, in looking at the uh, screen option one that Jim described, we were integrating the uh, grade six on the first floor. Um, had some modifications there. Again, it was greater than 7,500 square feet, so it included the full sprinkler system, full fire alarm and um, it derived a, a total project cost, a construction cost just under 15 million with the total project cost of uh, 18.6. Uh, option two, which was essentially the first floor planning, we were relocating some toilet rooms that were closer to the uh, cafeteria. We were creating those next generation learning spaces, those breakout spaces that Jim described. Again, wanted to make a better school, uh, make it more relevant to current teaching methods. Uh, in addition to that, we're looking at ways to minimize the uh, windowless classrooms and better purpose those spaces on the second floor, as well as creating the breakout spaces there. So again, the costs that are uh, uh, estimated are about 16.3 million for construction, total project cost of uh, 20.5. Option three that Jim described, that was the exercise when we were challenged because option one and two actually had some unassigned spaces. And it, um, as Dr. Morris indicated, it really challenged the, uh, the educators to look at how they're currently using those spaces and is a better way to utilize them. So as Jim mentioned, that really is a no-cost option. We can, um, there's the opportunity to integrate the sixth grade in the existing middle school facility and essentially just relabel the rooms. Uh, no, the infrastructure is in place, the, you have basically a room-to-room assignment of space and it will, it will function. It will function well for you and your students. And then as Jim described, we started layering on these, wouldn't these nice to be have um, interventions, the secure entrance. Again, that's about a uh, $771,000 total co uh, construction cost, just under a million dollar project. Um, then you do the, uh, add the maker space only Again, that room itself would be about $300,000, uh, total project about $363,000. Now again, that's assuming level of finish. Uh, we went through the images quickly, but there's a variety of uh, options in terms of finishes and equipping that space that are available to the district. So again, we wanted to create a budget that gave you some options some flexibility to decide really what you wanted to do in that space. So that's high-end technology, that's reusing the existing electrical, uh, uh, redefining that room, you'll have to adjust the mechanical systems. So again, that addresses those costs as well. And then option six, it's the summation of options four and five. So if you were to decide that you wanted to 
pursue the secure entrance and create that maker space in the existing wood shop. Again, about a million dollar construction cost, about a million three in terms of total project costs. Uh, Jim mentioned in his uh, discussion that there is an accessibility upgrade report on the straight KMA prepared that for the uh, region and they identified costs. They identified the material costs. We also know that they are working with the region to identify certain a number of those items that the district can uh, self-perform. So what we did is we took, a, and that's averaging about 18% of the costs from the different uh, estimates. So we took 72% of their identified costs for the middle school material costs, and then we added a labor cost to that to arrive at the, I can't read my own numbers, but I think it says $246,000 of direct cost. Okay, that's the material labor cost. There will be overhead costs, but again, if you're self-performing it, might be a smaller contractor, it would be unfair to say that you're gonna have the full burden of what we were forecasting for the larger projects on these individual light items. Uh, likewise with the owner soft costs. There will be some, but to define them, not knowing when they're gonna be deployed or if they're gonna be deployed with other work, uh, we wanted to at least provide you a baseline that we knew we were confident when, which is the direct costs. Um, in addition, we touched on the, uh, the roofing project. I know that Gale Associates has prepared an estimate about 2.4 million. There's a conversation about making it a solar ready roof. And again, we touched on the advisory board said, well, if we're gonna do the roof, wouldn't it be nice to get some natural light into those windowless classrooms? So that number is being carried at $3 million. Part of our effort of going through the existing facility was to have our mechanical engineers study your existing systems, as well as us going through looking at the uh, general conditions of the facilities. We observed that there are a number of existing systems that are at or end, uh, near the end of their useful life. Um, they don't have to be updated to integrate the sixth graders into the middle school. However, given where they are in their life expectancy, we're recommending that those be considered as capital improvement projects that the district can plan for in the future. So again, we identified a number of those items. The uh, water heaters, for example, are at near the end of the useful life, need to be replaced. Likewise, with the 100 kilowatt generator, emergency generator, proper life size to meet today's code and meet the needs of this facility, it, need, it would need to be replaced with a 300 kilowatt generator. Um, that's the sprinkler system and fire alarm. Again, that is if you don't do any of the other work and that's a standalone project. So you're looking at putting a sprinkler system in 195,000 square feet of space and a fire alarm system for 197 square feet of space. Uh, the electrical switch gear, we know that it is a Federal Pacific switch gear. At the end of its life, it should be replaced. I understand that the district is, or town of Amherst? Uh, Elementary mm -hmm. schools, right? Yeah. Are replacing some of those panels. So it's something that the, the region is familiar with. Um, in addition, there's a bi-directional amplification system is recommended. Again, with today's technology, first responders, their ability to communicate in a building that has a lot of steel, it is recommended. You currently don't have that, but it is something that our engineers uh, recommend that you consider. Um, then there were the site items that Jim touched on. Again, those are nice to have. The parent loop was identified in the KMA report. Uh, from a safety standpoint, needing to be able to separate that, adding bollards, there's an opportunity here to integrate that as part of this work. So we created a line on cost for that, about $264,000. We touched on the playscape area because that was something that the advisory board talked about. And um, given the natural terrain that is around the middle school, we're cutting into a hill. Uh, so to create about an 8,000 square foot playscape area, there would be a segmental landscape retaining wall. Uh, there would be a variety of uh, play surfaces, rubberized play surface, asphalt surfaces. Again, the direct cost of that is estimated to be about $700,000 uh, for that size area. Um, also, as uh, the advisory board was walking through the school, how can we make the existing middle school a better image of its 1965 or 69 self? A coat of paint might go a long way to brighten those hallways. So uh, we had a line item for that. That was about $600,000. And again, that might be something that the district itself perform during the summers. Uh, again, don't know what the labor and uh, resources are available, but it's something that's out there that might have a significant impact at a very low cost. 
and then the uh, sky tubes that Jim spoke about. Again, that's about a $62,000 direct cost to have uh, 57 of those introduced. That would be uh, nine in each classroom. There are 19 windowless classrooms in the plan. And then lastly, the no-cost solution does have a cost. That is new signage. And that's about, uh, some of you better eyes can tell me. Shade under 10,000. Shade under 10,000, okay, thank you. And again, all of these, uh, some, uh, talking with Dr. Morris, like the signage, might come out of just the operating budget. Uh, there are allowances for those type of line items, and some of these other items could be planned as a capital improvement project. Before we move on, any questions? So, I threw a lot of data at you. Yeah, so. and, just, and just as a note for the different committees, I don't know how we did it, but unless I'm misreading the clock, we, in terms of the agenda as posted, we, we, we've moved through almost all the time we had for this item before even getting to the high school. Um, so i just making note of that. Uh, but it means we're probably going to be running late on this joint meeting. Um, are, there, uh, are there questions from the committee? Or, or any, any committee? Can you, can you explain what a parent loop is? That's what parent drop off. Oh, uh, you have your buses driveway. that will drive, drive up and then for a parent to arrive at the school, drop off the student or pick that student up. Okay. Call it a parent loop. <laughs> Mr. Menino, then Mr. Nomar. What class size were you assuming for the sixth grade? That was 21 students, Jim? Yeah, I think we're looking at a range of 20 to 21. Because I calculated 27. Um, well, the total population divided by eight rooms. We'd actually have 10 rooms. And oh, some, of those are, yeah, some of those are special ed classrooms. Um, Take back, I got it. Okay. Mr. Demo? Um, I just wanted to appreciate the level of detail and organization that you put into this. Um, and really easy to compare. I, this is really a digestible. I, I, I feel like I'm on Amazon and I'm shopping and comparing, you know. <laughs> Other users have bought. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so a, a big difference in the draft versus the final uh, cost that I noticed on ARM uh, Options 4. I went from 8.1 down to 1, that, which, which is nice. Uh, I just wanted to see, like, where that may have come from. Well, we redefined the uh, scope of work. Uh, if you drill into it, you'll see that we have less area in those options than we had previously. Again, this is an iterative process. Anytime we look at it, we look to refine it and improve it. That's why there is, and we're, again, trying to make sure that we're making the best recommendation for the district that's realistic. Um, and that came out of the conversation, again, with the advisory board as well. Always, test, uh, always pushing us to improve. All right. Mr. Uh, and then, um, so uh, you had shown some of the locations of the special ed uh, rooms. Um, so in Amherst, we have three specialized uh, special ed programs uh, across the district that are, that those students, when they come to the middle school, go in some form to, to other programs. And so, and this might be a Dr. Moore's sure. question, but I was just wondering how that was thought through in terms of the design of what the sixth grade needs versus the seventh. And uh, so at this level of detail, we, we added one space so that there'd be six classrooms with specialized um, program because if we think about the sixth graders folding into those seventh and eighth grade specialized programs, we wanted to make sure we had the sufficient space to support those students. So um, the other thing we were really conscious of is to um, see where class spaces were now, like the Ames program has some equipment that we didn't want to necessarily move, not just from a cost basis, but just why would you move, wait, if you don't have to, why would you? Um, and also trying to assure that there wasn't like a block of six rooms in a row that was the specialized program spaces. They should be integrated into where the classroom spaces are. Um, and um, some of this was just taking a look at our current infrastructure, like the SSP program is currently where the computer labs are, but being that we're in a one-to-one -one computing environment, um, those spaces um, wouldn't work for that. But in talking to the special ed admin team, they felt like actually it was really nice for SSP to have one large space and one smaller space so that there could be instruction and happening and a breakout for students who needed it. So um, Dr. Brady in particular was helpful in thinking about that, as was the middle school administrators who are keen to that. Thank you. Keep rolling. All right. Oh, Jimmy, so you're up. It's okay. What? Other oh, I'm Don't sorry. I missed, I missed your... My only question was from the security standpoint on the front door. You said you reconfigured the stairs a bit. Could you describe? Well, I mean, we really haven't designed a solution there. I think we've assigned some dollars that we are comfortable could solve the okay. issue. Um, but yeah, because that is a vertical area, the lobby is vertical. Right now, people, if they come in that front door, they actually have access to the stairs. Um, so we just think that's 
that's a condition that needs to be corrected. Okay. So then we'll do no that solution, through design. No solution, but just an point. appropriate dollar figure. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I think we can be briefer with the high school. Um, just yep. be, I think it'll become clear. I'm not pushing. I'm just, oh, yeah. I just wanted yeah. to figure if we had no questions, we keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so we did go through the same exact process with the high school, fitting the 7th through 12 in this building. Um, option one, and, and with the high school, there's a site plan that goes with the building plan. So you can see in this area, um, because we're adding two grades to the school, we're going to have to add parking for staff, um, and we're also taking into consideration student parking at the high school, which is obviously different than the middle school. Um, so you can see, just to orient everybody, play fields. Uh, we've actually labeled the culverted Tan Brook, which is underground. It actually passes under those play fields. Um, so we had to consider some of the setbacks um, when it comes to building or expanding. Um, so in this diagram, you can see we've expanded the parking loop on the, on the left side of the building, which is the west side of the building. Um, that's currently where uh, some academy drops off. There is some staff parking on that side. But we've actually expanded the loop. Um, to accommodate possible middle school drop-off separate from the high school, and then continued the loop for emergency <coughs> access all the way around and added some staff parking on the, the upper part of this drawing, which is the north part of the site. So the, the reorganization of this building, introducing the 7th and 8th graders to this building is, is somewhat of a complex problem. We started with option one, putting the 7th grade in the back wing of the high school and then adding some space at, at, in a three-story addition off the north end of the building, which would accommodate at least one team of eighth graders, and then take over some of the tech ed spaces. You, you have the electronics lab, the wood shop, in the, that whole tech ed wing, and we would convert that to another eighth grade team, introduce some of the special ed programs, um, which then facilitates moving some of those tech ed spaces, relocating them. Um, so essentially, the high school remains as it is on this floor. Summit Academy stays where it is, but we have to relocate a bunch of uh, world language classrooms and the tech ed spaces. So what we do is we move those to the second and third levels of that. So since it's a three-story addition, what you can see is we've now added some science labs, some classrooms on the second floor, which allows us to re- um, organize some of the departments. We're able to, on the second floor, put math and science together, which are two, two departments that, that usually are kind of working together. And then the third floor, we've added some classrooms to that, and we've located the social studies and English departments together. Um, so isolating that seemed to work from, from an organizational standpoint. What we found was the middle school, the 7th and 8th grade, was lacking some of the program spaces and, and the extra space that they really needed. Um, so the advisory board got into a discussion um, and administrators got into a discussion, how are we going to accommodate lunch for the 7th and 8th graders? Would they go to the big cafeteria? So we talked a little bit about expanding that cafeteria. but. Option two actually looks at expanding the, the built addition and giving more of that new space to the seventh and eighth graders. So you can see the site plan is organized kind of the same as, as I described in option one. You can probably go right to the floor plan. Um, so you can see here, there, there's a much bigger addition off the back of the building. And as part of the discussion and a reaction to the discussion, we're now providing the seventh and eighth graders with their own gym their own music room, their own art room, their own cafeteria, and their own library. So it's essentially building a middle school off the back of the high school um, because we really weren't sure how we could schedule the cafeteria and accommodate all those extra students, how the media center was going to accommodate that, as well as the gym. So a lot of the discussion discussions drilled down to how are we going to schedule these spaces. And since the high school is so close to capacity right now with their scheduling, we really couldn't get our, our head around how we we're going to make it work. Option two gives you all that extra space. And the seventh and eighth graders, it becomes a, a much easier way to handle and also an easier way to um, keep the seventh and eighth graders separate from the older high school students. So the 
upper floor, you can see we've actually added um, more classroom space up above here, but we are able to group the science and math department for the high school on the second floor and the English and social studies departments on the third floor. So all the high school students uh, take over the second and third floors here. So the third option that we looked at was actually flipping that entire um, back addition. Option two, we were proposing the main entry come in from the east side of the building, which would be the right side of this drawing. Um, we're somewhat limited with the existing wetlands that's there. Um, we had to deal with a 75-foot building setback and a 30-foot road setback, um, which really constricted that side of the building, and it just didn't seem like a very welcoming, um, open uh, entry to the building. Uh, it was very limiting. So we, we flipped the entire scenario here and the entry to the middle school would come in from the west side. So the left side of that addition would be dedicated to uh, the seventh and eighth grade entry. So let's go to the floor plan. So you can see here uh, we're, we're providing the same type of program. So the seventh and eighth graders get their own library, gymnasium, cafeteria, stage, um, but you can see the middle school administrative office is over on the west side. So that becomes the seventh and eighth grade entry. Um, it, it works well with the bus loop off that side of the building by extending it. The buses could drop off the high school students at the front of the building, loop around and drop the seventh and eighth graders off at their entry point. They come right into the building and then they would, they would live in that seventh and eighth grade wing and then right back out with very little reason to, to mix with, with the high schoolers up front. Um, and then the second floor, you can see similar approach. Once again, it's a three-story addition. We're adding the classroom space that the high school would need on the second and third floor. And then going hand in hand with that, we've run through the pricing scenarios. Um, so if you flip your two-sided sheet, Doug can run through those for you. Uh, same approach as we had with the middle school, so uh, similar factors. Again, driven by the areas, uh, you can see option one. It was about a 25,000 square foot addition proposed that um, arrived at about a $27 million construction cost, $33.8 million total project cost. Option two, which was, and again, the reason we went to option two was the conversation from the advisory board that it felt like the middle school was jammed into the high school. It didn't have an identity, so we're challenged with providing a solution that did provide an identity for the middle school. That generated option two, and it's about a 72,000 square foot facility, uh, single story addition for the middle school, second and third story addition for the high school classrooms. Again, that arrived at about a $43.8 million construction project, about a $54.7 million total project cost. The last solution, again, this is part of the evolution of the project. We're getting better at our planning. Uh, we were able to use the same program that we have for option two, flipping the entrance, and arrive at a 62,000 square foot addition. So we're able to have a more compact, more efficient layout. Um, and again, the cost there, about 36.9 million construction project and $46 million total project. Just like in the, at the middle school, KMA has done a study of the high school, so there are accessibility upgrades that do need to happen. So again, the material and labor costs that are estimated for the high school are just north of a million dollars. Again, the water heaters need to be replaced, as does the emergency generator. And about, uh, there's about 120,000 square feet of the existing high school that is not currently sprinklered. So that would need to be brought up to code as well in the event of any one of these three options. So again, if that were to be a line item that the district wanted to do as a capital improvement project, we provided the cost for those two uh, functions as well. Uh, this, um, that's correct. Any right. questions? Yeah. An obvious question. These are very good estimates and alternatives. What do we do now? How do we go about selecting uh, an option? I think you, you want to take to that one? That. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, why don't we run through the, the committees and see if there's any, any questions, um, and then we'd love to get on, on that, and then we'll go to the superintendent's comments. So. It looks like the... Um, the microphone. The oh, you want to pass the mic? So make sure you pick up my little tiny arms. 
It looks like the additional parking and the additional building push out into the JV soccer fields and also eliminate the snake pit, which is where the football team practices in the fall and the lacrosse is in the spring. And right now, we're, our fields are at a premium and we really can't afford to lose those unless they've been magically moved someplace else. Yeah. yeah, and and early on we were given the field study, so there were several recommendations done with a field reconfiguration study. Um, the pros and cons of putting an addition on that building, you know, we looked at all four sides of the building, and wherever you put an addition, it's going to displace something. So be it a practice field, be it parking, a bus loop, um, and at a very high level, we ran through the replacement. So what, whatever you displace, you need to replace somewhere, somehow. Um, and the cost of that, I, I think, has a number of def different implications. Um, so once we had that conversation with the advisory board, we kind of backed off and we said, what would be the least invasive place for an addition? And, and the early studies we actually did identify that north side in the practice field, un fully understanding the implication of the athletic program. Um, but to displace parking in front of the building, I think would become an even bigger problem, especially from a vehicular circulation mm -hmm. standpoint. So I, I think it was a catch-22, but we do recognize the fact that there is an impact, um, and we're hoping that the field study that was done ahead of this um, gives some recommendations that could hopefully solve mm. the problem that you identify. <laughs> not, not at all. Yeah. It, it's a tight site. I was on, I was it's on a that tight committee. site. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Superintendent, do you have anything to add? Just very briefly, Mr. Farrow, the athletic director, was on the advisory board, and he's highly cognizant of what you shared, Mr. Sullivan, and, and would certainly second that piece. Okay. So why don't we run, th run through, see if there are other comments or questions. Okay, Superintendent. Yeah, but, oh. I just wanted to take, I, I felt like or I didn't thank them enough earlier, so I just wanted to thank JCJ again for their professionalism and creativity. It was great to be on the, on the board. Thanks. Sure, so um, I'll just uh, say a couple things. Um, so, as you know, the advisory board, or you may know, advisory board wasn't a voting body, uh, um, but uh, I did check with them about before making these statements at the last meeting to make sure that I was reading the room right, that there was truly consensus on a couple of things. So I, I got lots of nodding heads and, and hands up, um, so I think it's worth sharing that. So um, the consensus of the advisory board, and I agree with it, uh, is to it doesn't seem to, to that group or to me to worth continuing the exploration of 7 through 12, um, putting the middle schools and the high school. And there's a couple reasons why. One is the high cost, right, of the slide that's up right now. Um, if thinking about saving funds or being more efficient, adding um, essentially a middle school wing onto a high school seems to not uh, resolve, not support that premise. Uh, additionally, educationally, um, I did a quick survey of the 11 districts in Hampshire, Hamden, and Franklin County uh, that have either 7 through 12 or 6 through 12 secondary schools. This is in that 500-page document because it's in the notes. So if anyone read very closely, you might have seen it. Um, but um, on average, there's schools that have that wide a grade span are about two-thirds smaller than what this school would be. And the next largest one is only, at, I think, at 57% of what this school, school would be. One district that's similar size to us tried to do this and was um, voted down uh, by a large measure in another community in, in Hamden County recently. Um, so it really is an outlier if we were thinking about this in terms of the size of the school and the grade span. Uh, that between the cost make it seem like, uh, for me, um, I feel what I feel, um, sometimes when you're saying not to pursue something, it has a negative feel. I get asked that question, and, and my predecessors have at four town meetings for many, many years. You know, could the middle schoolers fit in the high school? And, and now we have an answer to that, and it's a complicated yes and. Here's what the cost would be, and then we'd have a middle school building to figure out what to do with. Um, so um, there was a lot of educational concerns expressed by the uh, advisory board I, I, as well. Um, there wasn't uh, many people in the advisory board who saw educational advantages of moving to a 7th through 12th grade model, um, and a lot of concerns, actually, educational concerns that were expressed. Conversely, on the advisory board, there was strong support for further exploration on the educational model side of a grade six through eight model um, for the middle school. 
uh, both because of the reasonable potential costs and because of possible educational advantages. Um, to support that point, I'll just say briefly, I want to come back in two weeks and, and do this more fully. It's a very common model. Uh, so as opposed to being you know, sort of an outlier of a, what I just shared about the 7 through 12, 6 through 8 middle schools are uh, the most common model, grade span model, both in Massachusetts and across the country. Uh, we'll hear about math in a minute. There was certainly a recommendation in the math report that people have seen to think about where sixth graders are educated, which is the frame that I have, is what's developmentally appropriate for students in grades 11 through, uh, ages 11 through 14. Because so, I think we get into middle school and junior high school and it's a bunch of nomenclature that gets confusing and means different things to different people. But for me, it's what's a middle level education that we want for our students entering adolescence. And that's the large frame that, that I think is worth pursuing. Um, I was in touch with many of my colleagues across Massachusetts about models, and I'll share more in two weeks about that. But the short story is there was a lot of positivity for districts that either have six through eight middle schools or have, in the last 10 years, went to a six through eight middle school model. Um, and so what I'd like to do is come back in two weeks, and whether that is a joint meeting or a region meeting is up to the different committee. It's not my decision. But I'd like to actually flesh out a process and a timeline of how to uh, further um, so this was a really healthy process, quick, and I agree with Ms. Cassens' points. A very different process because it wouldn't be an architectural process, it would be an educational process of what would a sixth grade or eighth grade uh, middle school look like? What are the educational implications? What are the social emotional uh, developmental implications? What are the special needs ELL implications? And I think we need to have that as a separate process from what just occurred uh, to then bring back um, to the committees and then to towns to see how they felt about it. I feel like <coughs> Because it doesn't cost money to put the sixth grader in the middle school, is not a reason to put sixth graders in the middle school. I think we need to open that door and say, what would be some potential advantages, disadvantages, uh, and really have a study that um, has community involvement, both from parents, guardians, staff members, and perhaps school committee members. I appreciate Ms. Cassens' role in this one. Um, to really uh, have more answers along that dimension, to think about what do we want for our 11 through 14 year olds in the, in the member towns. Uh, and then another process that would follow that for each town to consider its thoughts and, and all the logistics, which is probably the longest of the three processes uh, in my prediction. Um, I would predict it would be the longest. But I'd like to come back in two weeks um, and probably not go deeper than I have now. I can certainly answer any questions uh, about what that process might look like, what a timeline might look like for that process and for considerations for towns. To be really clear, I'm not thinking of anything super soon in terms of outcome, in terms of process. That's really where I want to... Uh, lay that out. So before um, we, we go to questions from the committee or any yeah. comments, I just put a fine, first off actually I want to thank the advisory board, uh, JCJ, and everyone who was involved in the facilities use planning study. We've, we've been talking about it for a long time <laughs> and we were planning for it for a long time and it's something that our communities were really interested in. and. Uh, it's a moment of work, right? We've gotten back, over, I think, a really good um, and well-executed well report. And it's a starting point for a conversation. Uh, and it's, a good informa it's good information that can ground what we choose to do going forward. The other thing I'd, I'd point out in the, your comments you just made are, A, you don't have a lot of details. Right. B, you're going to come back in two weeks to either any one of our committees or our committees jointly. Uh, and see, I think it, in my view at this point, you, I hope with the community, have earned some trust that your model of approaching topics like this is to be very um, deliberate, have a very clear, transparent process, and be very engaged with different stakeholders, both <coughs> professionally as well as in the community. And so I just, I'm saying this out loud now, that it sounds like a really big thing to talk about, and I think it will be in many ways, but don't get ahead of yourselves. Right. Um, there's going to be lots of opportunity for you to put flesh on the bones of what you're talking about and what the process would be, and many opportunities for mutual learning and engagement from staff in the community. Absolutely. Is that right? That's that sounds perfect. Right. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we just go around the table, and if people have any questions or comments, they can make it, and then we'll move forward since we're way beyond our next topic, and I want to be respectful to the committees and the public. Is there any, anything at all? I, I would. Mr. Um, so, just as a side sort of benefit from this, Dr. Morris, we don't have to address this now, but before you know, we, we go on to the next step of the process of potentially sixth to the middle school, you know, one thing that this puts a fine point on is the general 
state of these two buildings. Yeah. And in Amherst, and I can say this because the Amherst School Committee is in session right now, um, there's, there's, a, there's high awareness of the, of the, the state of our elementary buildings and, and the, the urgent need to address those. Um, there's not as much of, an, of a uh, level of awareness, I would say, um, about the urgent need to address some of the mid and long term maintenance issues with the middle school and the high school building. And you know, we talk about 50 years or so being the, the life of these buildings. These, these are not spring chicken buildings. Right? And so when we talk about all, you know, things that are at end of life and things that, you know, for the next decade plus, were we to do a major change like this, um, it, it, it gives me some serious pause about our long term capital health as, as a region um, and, and what that might mean. And so it's more of a long-term food for thought, but it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a pretty big uh, variable in that big picture that um, I think should factor into our long-term plan. Sounds good. I would just like to agree with, um, I think, the consensus you heard, which is there's no value in pursuing the high school, from my opinion, to add two grades to it. It seems to have a lot of disadvantages. Um, and then from the middle school, high school, uh, upgrades to the middle school to allow sixth grade, I think um, I like the thought process of what's the educational value. Um, and sort of as an aside, I see both the maker space and the security entrance as things that are on our, even if we did nothing with a seventh and eighth grade, we should be looking forward, forward towards doing. And so I almost want to remove them as facility use, like these are things that as a region we need to fix, right? We can't have a school that you can just walk in on into and makerspace is something that educationally, you know, I think the high school's done some work to doing and I'd like to see that in the middle school. So I almost don't want to consider it as part of a facilities use study. That's really what we need to do anyway. Thank you very much. Right. So our next topic is uh, is called very simply math update. A simple title for a big subject. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in, in speaking with uh, the superintendent, uh, I wanted to lay out that again, this is a topic where uh, they're going to be laying out. You've seen the PowerPoint, hopefully, their thoughts. But uh, this is not the the last time we're going to be discussing this. In fact, uh, the superintendent has assured me that for uh, the regional committee, and I'd imagine this would be true for the other committees, he wants to have this a standing item through the rest of the spring and into the early summer so that any, uh, any decisions that are being made, any updates that are being made um, can be brought forward both to the public as well as also the committees. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to say this. Uh, Dr. Morris, and you can just pause me if you want to. Uh, you'd expressed to me the sense that you thought that within your, the purview of your duties as educational leader for our districts, that you were not going to bring forward a vote on this math curriculum change, but rather you were looking for regular feedback from us, hence the commitment on your part to bringing this up, talking about it, and updating and engaging our committees at every single meeting. I'm saying this, one, to frame out the process that you that you had said you were going to put forward um, at the beginning. Second, also, to sort of frame our discussion, because if you thought you had, like, one shot at this conversation now, and it was you weren't had no idea when you'd talk about it again, then we could be here for the next three hours. Um, now that you know that your very next meeting will likely include a discussion of this topic, um, we could probably close the book on this thing at a reasonable point when we feel like we've exhausted the topic. Um, is there anything you want to add on that? Oh, I'll just introducing Mr. Shane on the topic. Yeah, just, just very briefly, just to second that thought that uh, we're seeing this, this is happening live, <coughs> right? Uh, and I don't mean literally this meeting, but the work is happening live. And so our goal and our objective is to keep the committees informed of that work. And the only way we can do it is really bring up this topic at essentially every meeting this spring. Uh, because the amount of work that's happening and the pace that it's happening at means that if we came back six weeks from now, a lot of things are going to happen in six weeks, and that wouldn't be keeping the committees updated. So uh, our hope is that tonight what Mr. Sheehan will do, our curriculum coordinator, is share uh, a bit of the response from the recent math update. Uh, it's nice to have all the committees here so we can include sixth grade in the conversation from a curricular perspective. They were That's why they were looked at in the report, and from a curriculum 
tools and curriculum standards perspective, they're lumped together in the secondary schools. Um, but that this would be one of mo many uh, updates that we do this spring. So as the committee has questions or generates questions from the community, uh, that there's multiple fora for um, those questions to be asked. As, as Mr. Njima said, this isn't the last time. Even if you want it to be, it wouldn't be the last time that we're going to talk about math this spring because it's going to be a live interactive process and we're going to model that at school committee meetings. And with that, I'll introduce Mr. Sheehan. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Um, and, and thank you. I also realize for those of you that wouldn't normally be here for this meeting, it's an extra committee meeting for you. But just to echo what Dr. Morris said, it, it's, it's impossible to have this discussion without sixth grade. Um, the state frameworks for mathematics and every other subject are six through eight and nine through 12. Um, so it's while sixth grade is elementary school in our communities, in the larger world, the vast majority of school districts, it's middle school. And so textbooks are written that way. The state looks at it that way. Um, so it makes for an awkward conversation just to just look at 7 through 12. Um, yeah, you can click through. Um, so in your packet, um, you received the presentation as well as a timeline document. And I designed the slides to sort of be a, a more human way of going through the timeline document. So I won't spend a lot of time on that unless you have specific questions on that with the, with the hope that a lot of it is explained through the presentation. Um, and I should also say, in addition to other committee meetings, that some of you have emailed me. Feel free to email, get in contact with questions and things like that as time goes along, too. Um, so as far as immediate work, we got the consultant report. Um, it was very detailed um, and very helpful. And um, Sue Looney and Heidi Sabnani, who you met, have both been very responsive as far as questions since then. Um, they've been great at responding to emails, um, even some things like asking for certain things that they used, um, a list of the survey questions that they used and things like that that people were interested in seeing. Um, so that's been very helpful to have that connection. Um, I should also note that the work going forward and the timeline that you got is, is a plan to direct our work there will be necessary adjustments made. Um, everybody knows all of us are going to have to be flexible with that to make sure that as things come up that are unexpected or require a change, we'll adjust things in that timeline. Uh, the most immediate work is to kind of develop a vision. Uh, and, and one of the things the consultants emphasized is you shouldn't go forward with making changes unless you know what your vision for mathematics learning is. And in fact, we had a, a working group made up of faculty and a parent representative, a math working group it was called, that actually began this work before this all happened. Um, and so we have a document that was a theory of action that they put together. And in fact, our elementary math specialists put together their own vision for elementary math. Um, and so we're not starting from scratch in doing that. We have some, actually quite a head start going. And that group is due to meet the beginning of next week to work on that, um, and I'll be meeting with the high school math faculty later this week, and that's part of what I want to discuss with them um, so that we, we know where we're going and what we're trying to do. Um, in terms of course revisions, uh, looking at textbooks, things like that, we are going to contract with Looney Math Consulting to guide us through that process, and I've already begun to have those discussions. And we'll have a textbook review process um, that it, it's defined by your policy, frankly. Um, so there will be public input. Uh, we do plan to make materials available to gather input. And that wouldn't be any different if we were talking about science, if we were talking about kindergarten health, and anything like that. Um, and we'll be developing a process to evaluate our choices based on the vision, based on what we know are best practices. Uh, let's see, um, the math curriculum specialist. Uh, this really is a key piece here. Um, and, and one thing that the teachers feel is necessary, the consultant uh, thinks is a good, good idea. It's, there's a lot of work going forward. Um, so this would be a position that it was in your proposed budget for next year. It's uh, currently a one-year position. And it would be um, a faculty member who could support the implementation of this work 
and would be a natural link from grade six up through grade 12. Because one of the problems that we've encountered and is very easy to fall into is to have these giant gaps where students make transitions between grade six and seven, between grades eight and nine, um, for plenty of good reasons, geography being primar a primary one. Teachers don't have the opportunities to communicate. They work in different buildings on different schedules. Um, and that can cause real problems. And so we want to try to correct for those sorts of things. And having someone who is a math teacher who can get in there and help with implementation and work on communication um, really will be key. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to talk more about the achievement gap later. So I think I'll just sort of hold that because there are some slides devoted to that. And let's see. All right, yeah. Um, so as far as textbook selection, we'll really be looking at two parallel um, processes, one for grades 6 through 8 and one for grades 9 through 12. Um, they're, they're unique in a lot of ways, and they're similar in other ways. So it's, it'll be something that both middle school, including sixth grade, and high school will be examining will be supported by Looney Math Consultants. I already mentioned the, the vision to guide that process. We want to make sure we evaluate materials. Um, one thing that it is very important now also is looking at a balance between things that look like, tech, like physical textbooks and technology. Um, most of the good curricula now are available in both formats. Um, and there are things to consider with regard to that. We have students who live in places where the internet has not effectively reached their homes yet, so we can't have something that's internet dependent that students would be working on at home. Um, on the flip side, we have one-to-one -one Chromebooks in the schools, so we want to be able to use that resource. And there's a lot of uh, modeling and things that are used in teaching math now that would be very helpful for teachers and students to have access to. Um, and ideally, we'll be able to have teachers test drive some of these materials during this evaluation. Um, it's tough at this time of year. Um, it's, it's the very first thing teachers will say is we have MCAS coming up. Um, and it's difficult to fit in everything that needs to be taught without thinking about trying out something new. And that's something that we're going to be working on to see if we can fit that in so teachers can actually use some of the materials to get a real evaluation. You can only get so much from looking at them in front of yourself or hearing from a, a sales rep. I'm just going to add one thing that I uh, was on a phone call with Ms. Mrs. Sheehan and Ms. Looney. Uh, one of the things that was interesting that I posed and, and Tim and I had both spoken about was, is there some advantage to thinking about a 6 through 12 curriculum? Mm -hmm. So some of the publishers, you know, they'll create a middle school series and a high school mm -hmm. series in the same publisher. And I was, you know, I made an assumption that, yes, that that would actually be advantageous. And the feedback we got was actually these books, the texts are written by different authors for the most part. A middle school model doesn't necessarily have the same author, so the pages may look similar. And some of the philosophy may be aligned, but, but not necessarily. And as evidence, they cited some of the external reviews of math curriculum that actually review it by grade level, because there are some text series that have really different rankings and um, based on which grade level you're talking about, even through a six through eight grade span, three grade levels. Um, so it was really helpful that, to hear that it was important that these two processes were talking to one another, but not that they were the same or we would be locked into selecting the same curriculum 6 through 12, um, because even though, the again, the books may have the similar covers, that doesn't actually guarantee alignment, and there's mm -hmm. counterexamples to that. So that was really helpful mm -hmm. yeah, for us, us to talk through and, and hear from, from her. And it's not that it can't work. It's not that it's you know, should be thrown out, but she really saw no advantage to thinking about it. She said it's actually a danger to thinking about it through a 6 through 12 lenses. We should pick one curriculum across because the advantages, um, they're, they're, the assumptions I'm making about the advantages were not accurate. Mm -hmm. Let me actually click. Sure. So then now getting a few weeks out now, uh, the math working group, that group needs to continue to work, and it, it's something that met for a while. It was established originally to look at access to our math courses for students with disabilities, um, and sort of naturally grew and morphed into something that was looking at a larger topic, and in fact, now really needs to be a group that continues to meet um, 
addressing the big issues now, but then also meeting into next year and years beyond to check in on these things. Um, because there is, if anyone stands in front of you and says, I've solved the achievement gap problem, they're probably lying to you. Um, there is always going to be a place where we need to be looking inward and figuring out where we're not doing the best service to students. Um, and unless we're continuously doing that, we're gonna miss those places. Um, there'll need to be communication with parents and guardians uh, and students uh, in terms of changes, uh, whether it's course names that change, the textbooks certainly, um, access to intervention and things like that that we'll be working on. And I do have a couple slides on communication later on. Um, and, and the more immediate, of course, is incoming seventh graders and incoming ninth graders um, because it, it, there's an even higher level of newness and anxiety to things for those groups. And so that we'll be paying close attention to as well. Uh, let's see, uh, professional development. Um, there's both professional development that you want to provide for faculty around instructional practices, but there will also need to be professional development around any new tools. Um, this is a very big change for teachers, um, and frankly doesn't matter if you are an experienced veteran or a novice teacher. Changing textbooks is huge, um, and so with the district will really need to devote time and resources to that to make sure that teachers feel like they're supported, they're confident, they can do this rollout um, in their classrooms. And there's a piece of that that's front end loaded and a piece of that that's ongoing and where that math instructional specialist will come into play as well. Uh, and then there are other pieces that come into this, curriculum mapping, um, assessment development, and, and how those assessments are used across courses. Um, Intervention supports, this is a big one. This goes to the achievement gap question. This goes to a lot of other questions. Uh, the, there'll be a new intervention teacher at the middle school, which was also in your budget proposal. Uh, this is something that the math teachers at the middle school, when it came out in the consultant report, the response was, I told you so. Uh, they've pointed this out as a need. They're very happy that this is gonna be happening and they're enthusiastic about participating in how that position functions and what it does. Uh, because there are a lot of different ways to use an intervention teacher and we want to make sure that we do it in the best possible ways. Uh, let's see. Uh, the curriculum specialist uh, is up there. And again, I've already mentioned quite a bit of that. So, and then future work. Again, I explained that the achievement gap is going to be something that we'll be looking at ongoing. There are going to be early fixes. There are going to be things that are more long term. Um, uh, in terms of professional development for other subject areas in which math plays a prominent role, uh, when I was putting together the timeline that you have, I had floated that by the principals and, and math faculty and so forth. And one of the principals brought that up. I said, there's math going on in other classes. We want to make sure that that fits well with what we're teaching students in math class. So it made a lot of sense. And integration is another one. Um, and the architects mentioned earlier, science and math being near each other and working together. And that's very true. Um, so subjects where there's integration happening, we need to make sure that there's effective support in that way um, and communication between faculty. And then sort of bigger things that come a little bit more in the future. At some point, we're gonna to need to take a look at our K to five math curriculum um, and ask a lot of the same questions of that. Um, it wasn't, that isn't something as urgent as we were hearing at grades six through 12, but when you make a change at one level, you need to then go back and look at the rest. Um, I think in an ideal world, you would look at K through 12, um, but you would need a lot more human resources and financial resources. And so I think that's gonna be down the road and, and a next step sort of thing. Uh, in the consultant report, there was recommendations about developing new STEAM personal finance and some other courses. And, and that is something that, uh, in fact, people have talked about before. So it, it'll be a good thing to take a look at and bring to you in the future. Um, and then of course, this moving sixth grade to the middle school 
came up in the architect report, it came up in our consultant report, this is going to be an ongoing question. Um, and for the reasons that I mentioned before, the way sixth grade curriculum is linked, linked is not a strong enough word. It is part of middle school curriculum as far as most of the world views it. Um, and it makes for an awkward uh, sort of place for sixth grade teachers when they're in the elementary school. So in terms of achievement gaps, um, there's some urgency there. Um, you saw numbers. You, uh, you've had discussions about this. This is not something that, that we can say we'll get to that in six months. Um, there are things we need to be doing now and, in fact, are doing now. Um, in terms of decisions we make about textbook selection and redesign of courses, that's going to need to be at the forefront of that. Um, that this is a group of students that we need to make sure that what we're teaching that that fits how they learn and how we can do a good job with that. Um, we need to review our instructional model. And, and there are some of these things that are already going on. And I do want to be cautious. Um, I want to make sure that you realize things that I say are not new things necessarily. It's not to say teachers are not doing these things. In fact, there are a lot of these things happening, but I think they're worth highlighting. Um, so one example, at grade six, there's this constant sort of review in the elementary schools as far as the model that they use for teaching, whether it's an elementary school self-contained classroom model, whether it involves students switching between classes. Um, a lot of that has been determined in recent years by the numbers of sixth graders, because there are certain things that you just simply can't make a decision if you don't have the right number of students. Um, and, and in many ways, it would be better if, if you had a team of three sixth grade teachers, if only one of them was the math teacher, um, rather than spreading it out across three people. You have someone who could really hone their skills in that way, and it would be easier to connect them to colleagues at the middle school as well. Um, the use of intervention is part of the instructional model. Um, and, and this comes into play a lot of different ways. And for those of you who are familiar with the elementary schools, you've seen and know about some of that. Um, students are supported in the classroom with an intervention teacher who comes in. Sometimes it's small groups out of the classroom. There are a lot of reasons to do it in very different ways. There's co-teaching happening. Um, which we've had great success with at the elementary schools and at the middle and high school in places where that's been implemented. Um, you hear about station teaching. Uh, and so, again, the way that people teach is different than all of us remember when we were in school. And we've tried to really move away from the model of the teacher stands at the front of the class, much like I'm doing right now. Um, and it is effective. It, <laughs> Um, and instead, the teacher does a smaller um, presentation or instruction to the class and then breaks the students up into groups and, can, and the teacher can work in stations where you have a group of students working independently, you have a group working closely with the teacher, you may have some using technology. Um, it's, it's a paradigm shift. Um, it's, it's challenging. There are other questions that come into play in terms of managing a class and, and it's, it's a lot of work. Um, frankly, it's easier to stand at the front of a classroom in a more traditional lecture style. Um, so it, it takes more time on the part of, of teachers to really figure out how to make station teaching and formats like that work. Tim, if I could jump in, just, just one other mm -hmm. thought. Um, I know you have other things to get on in the slide about achievement gap. One of the things that I found interesting is we met with middle school math faculty last week. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, you know, I think the other thing is engaging the faculty, which is embedded in all the things you're saying, but I just as a larger frame in what they see and what they see as challenges. And, and a couple of them were able to be very explicit about the current textbook selection um, and how they, they experience it um, contributing to different, or how it affects different learners differently and mm -hmm. perhaps not in the ways, definitely not in the ways that they nor we would feel um, the direction we want to go in. So, so I, I just think the, the conversations that we're having already to date are very are generative uh, mm -hmm. about issues. You know, it's one thing when you're Looney and Associates and doing an external review, and then when as the fa faculty are getting engaged, they're coming up with not. I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. the intervention teacher that was mentioned, but but they were very clear about um, 
you know, the particular textbook selection, as were students who, uh, you know, we'll get to this a little later in the agenda about strategic planning, are able to be very clear on what works for them and what doesn't work for them, mm -hmm. and works for their colleagues in class, their peers, and what doesn't work for them. So I do feel like the, um, the process that Mr. Sheehan's laying out, where we're getting different levels of community input into the process, the fact that the achievement gap is part of the conversation, drives the decision making. And I think that's just a critical point. I wasn't trying mm -hmm. to rush it, Tim. I just wanted to no, that, make a connection um, between that. And also timed well, because I needed a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the two points about numeracy screeners and explicit focus on conceptual understanding. Um, this has been something that we've, we've been doing work on. And, and it's something that the bulk of this work has been done at the earliest grades. Um, and you, you may have heard mention, we've been putting a lot of teachers through this AVMR training. Um, that's a trademark, it's Advantage Math Recovery. And it, it helps teachers focus on uh, students' numeracy skills and how to target instruction and intervention and how to do regular assessing that is not a test that takes an hour, but quick assessments to, to gauge where students are. Um, there have been quite a number of elementary teachers who have gone through this training, and it's, and it's taken some careful orchestration because it's a long train. It's about 30 hours of training. Um, and our three elementary math specialists became trained as <coughs> trainers a few years back. Um, and they've been incredibly dynamic in terms of um, generating interest from colleagues, helping them through the training, and then also the follow-up. Uh, because, of course, whenever you train someone on something, you can't just sort of say, okay, you know what you're doing, now off it go, off you go. Um, they've really th found ways to get in with teachers and help them work together and develop strategies. Um, the, it's something that is going to work its way up, um, I believe, and, and we're seeing that as teachers in kindergarten and first grade are using these strategies, Students are developing stronger conceptual understandings, and those, those students have not gotten to middle school yet. Uh, we're a few years in with that. There are some, some of the training is, is not as applicable to teachers who teach higher levels, uh, but some of it is. We had a first group of staff go through a fractions training, uh, which I had several teachers email me out of the blue saying how wonderful it was, um, which is a testament to that. Um, because the opposite is often true with professional development. Um, the other thing we've been doing, and again, this goes to the elementary schools, but an achievement gap doesn't just occur all of a sudden in seventh and eighth grade. It, it's something that develops as a result of things that have or have not happened prior to that. And the elementary schools have been focusing on looking at data longitudinally. Um, and have been developing ways to, to store and look at this data and use it for instructional decisions and use it for professional development decisions. And if you spoke to any of the elementary principals, they could probably talk to you for hours on the things that they've been doing with their staff uh, in terms of instructional strategies uh, to try to focus on some of these things. Um, let's see. Another good example, and I, I talked to a few of the elementary principals just to sort of get a sense of what's been going on, and, and one of them was saying, we, a good example at sixth grade in their school, teachers include a real-life applic application question in every math lesson um, so that they're trying to bridge that gap between here's sort of the theory of mathematics and here's how it's used in real life, uh, which is important, um, and especially with I mean, students, eh, this is just a school thing, so that they can see, especially heading into sixth grade, adolescent years, uh, the importance of this learning. Uh, let's see. And then uh, a lot of district and building-led um, PD around equity, uh, looking at instructional equity, looking at language. Um, so teachers have had to go through sheltered English immersion training. And this has to do with instructional language. You want to make sure it's, that students can access the academic content, and that's not something that is inhibiting their achievement. Um, and then the other key piece is to help administrators in that way so they know what to look for when they go into classrooms and how to support teachers doing that, because that is an important component. Um, and then in addition, communicating with families on how to support learning. Um, and in math, this is a particular challenge, because uh, families will often say, I didn't learn math this way. I don't know how to help my child. 
Um, and, and that is an absolutely accurate comment. Um, and it's something that I think that we can get better at in terms of communication and resources for families uh, because maybe you wouldn't be helpful, wouldn't be confident helping your child with calculus either way, but at least something to help families so that they see why something is being taught in a certain way and why it might look different than it did when you were in middle school or high school. All right, so this is on to the communication portion. Um, so for families, it's going to be important going forward that we have clear descriptions of any new course titles, course content, um, so that that information is out there for families and students. Um, pathways for acceleration. We currently have pathways so that students, as they're heading through high school math, can accelerate their math learning. And that's not something that we're giving up. That's something that needs to be articulated carefully and also looking at access to that. Um, it's, there are challenges in that. We want to make sure that any student who is prepared and eager to do something like that has access to those pathways. You want to be very careful in math as with other subjects. They don't create sort of gates that lock in front of them so that they can't ever move into something that, that they might be able to reach academically. Um, information about targeted intervention services. Um, so it's important for families to know what the resources are for their children um, and how they can get that assistance. And then I already mentioned the parent and guardian resources to support math learning. Uh, in terms of communication with all of you, uh, we want to make sure we keep you in the loop on course revisions and textbook selection and interventions and practices and professional development. Um, because you all have asked good questions and prompted things along. Um, and frankly, all of these things cost money. And you have a very important role in, in that piece of it. And so you need to be informed about where that comes into play. So I'll just maybe, if I could add, Absolutely. close this part and open up for questions, is that our plan would be to come back to the committee in two weeks from now with, um, in terms of select textbook selection process with dates uh, of when groups are getting formed, groups are meeting, public sessions that were referenced mm -hmm. earlier. Um, so that'll be, you know, we feel like as this visioning work is completed by staff um, and we now are working with, with Looney and looking at dates on a calendar that we would have those ready for our meeting in two weeks um, so that we can share with the larger community as well as the committee kind of the process going forward in the next eight weeks of what, what that looks like. You know, where we are now is visioning work that's that kind of that math working group that existed before will take on, but we know in short order we'll be in the world of textbook review. Serena? When do you estimate you will have made your decision on textbook selection? We would like to have a decision made so that materials can be in teachers' hands at the end of the school year um, so that we can do some professional development after the conclusion of the school year and teachers feel like they have time to become familiar with materials. Um, so end of, end of May, I think, we would want to have decisions finalized. So, and that's all, that is also something that I've already started to speak with publishers and have been very upfront about that um, and had a conversation with one today to get some information. And, and I said, our timeline is very aggressive. And he, well, what is it, he said. And I told him, he said, oh, we can work with that. That's, he said, school districts sometimes call us three weeks before the start of school and need materials, so. Mr. Shannon or the superintendent? Um, so one of the things that, uh, and I know you know this stuff inside out in terms of the, the feedback of, from the community, but something that we heard an awful lot mm -hmm. over the last couple of years was a concern from parents and students, but students usually through parents complaining to us, that, um, that the curriculum at the high school in particular um, didn't necessarily fit how their child learned, that there were mm -hmm. elements, and I mean structural elements, mm -hmm. like, so like this problem of the week business where like literally just the format of how mm -hmm. um, topics were introduced to students became structurally sort of perceived as an impediment to learning or a source mm -hmm. of frustration. And um, what I'm wondering is, in, 
and I'm sure no one ever intended that to be the case right. when, when, when the curriculum is chosen. So one thing I'm wondering is that while it is a good and laudable, and I think probably many people would clap at the notion of changing between now and this fall, I also sit here and I think to myself, what are you, how, what are you doing and how confident you're going to be able to engage parents and students, if you're reaching out to students at all, mm -hmm. um, so that when you're, when you're looking through textbooks and looking through curricula, that you, have, you do two things. One, you actually get feedback that might be right. helpful in evaluating, but also that for, the, for parents who are sitting out there saying, and I don't mean this pejoratively, I just mm -hmm. mean it sort of descriptively the way our emails looked. Um, well, that was a disaster. Um, you know, and so people worry, you know, how do you make sure if you're making a decision fast that there aren't right. elements that end up causing the same problems? And I'm not, I'm not saying you will. Right. I'm sort of saying as an introduction to something we're needing to do mm -hmm. going forward. Right. Um, what's either your thoughts or, or Dr. Moore, what are your thoughts on how you're trying to make sure that we, while we're moving fast, we don't move so fast that either, either we don't get that good information and feedback right. or B, people feel like they weren't engaged? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I mean, frankly, it's what like I have nightmares about now. Um, and and it, I'm trying to be very deliberate um, with anything that I'm doing around this, with communication, with looking at dates. Um, and, and Dr. Morris and I were on the phone with Sue Looney recently and, and looking at dates and trying to sort of negotiate even with them, saying, well, do you have any availability at this week or at this time? And, and keeping in mind things like April vacation, mm -hmm. uh, which falls right in the middle of, of this process. Um, so it's, it's going to be a challenge, um, but it's something that it, it's – in terms of my work, it's taking priority over just about everything else, um, for better or worse. And I think that that's, that's what needs to be in order to make this work in this amount of time. Um, and, and interestingly enough, I think you could take a whole year to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure you wouldn't make the same mistakes over that time either. Dr. Morris? Yeah, if I could add, I think just a couple things to add. And, and one, Two things. Um, so if you look at uh, the revision timeline, you know, I think it's worth noting the language that Mr. Sheehan used, which is convene faculty slash family slash student committees mm -hmm. to look at the textbook. So it's uh, embedding in the process that, well, we would have opportunities for public viewing and um, we want to uh, actually, um, Dr. Looney's going to come, uh, I think we have a date, Scott, I think we're mm -hmm. narrowing to a date. Um, where she has a public session that's solely for those communities, right? So um, that we really want to have. Well, a lot of this will be staff. Um, staff will be doing a lot of the, carrying a lot of the freight, which makes sense as the instructors. Uh, but we want to make sure that both students and families are integrated into the process of selection, uh, and that their voice is heard in actually a s distinctly separate meeting that uh, they can have with a consultant, um, not just with staff, but with a consultant to be able to go back and forth and, and learn. I think the second thing I want to note is go back to the comment Mr. Sheehan made earlier, which is around kind of those test drives. So the test drives are for staff primarily, mm -hmm. but there's also a test drive element for students to gather feedback of how did this instructional model feel to you? Did it work, not work? And that, um, that really both sides of that experience are going to be incredibly valuable feedback as we go towards textbook, textbook adoption. Okay, so I want to go around the table uh, and just see if people have questions or comments because also we're, we're running way over our time, so I just out of respect to everyone. Um, I had a couple of comments that I wrote down, and, and you don't need to answer them here. You can come back at the next, uh, whenever you brief us again, but just some thoughts that came to my mind. Um, you know, again, I, my initial thought was this uh, timeline seems a bit aggressive, um, mm -hmm. and so I know you have a lot of work, um, and... I just wonder if there's anything the school committee can do um, in particular to support this aggressive timeline. I'm, from what I'm hearing, I'm, my biggest concern from somebody who's not involved at all is the professional development for mm -hmm. teachers um, seems to be on an extremely tight timeline. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's anything the school committee do, can do to, to help that or um, you know what sort of expectations we have over the summer months, which normally are not used for, uh, you know, direct uh, 
teacher involvement, um, but so I'm just curious if there's something we can do to help. Um, and what is the life expectancy of a curriculum? <laughs> like, uh, you know, a textbook lasts typically 10 years and then mm -hmm. we're finding something new. Is it a 15 year? Um, and that partially leads into a couple of my other thoughts, which are um, my experience as a teacher or as a parent of an elementary student is I had to be taught how to teach math to my kid and I'm an engineer. Like I, the way mm -hmm. math is taught today was, and, and the teachers were very helpful in teaching me that. Um, and I think I wouldn't be very successful helping my student if I didn't have that. And mm -hmm. so given the, the diversity of people we have in the region, um, what sort of curriculum supports there are for people who maybe aren't English um, mm -hmm. language as their mm -hmm. primary language because the math is, um, in my experience, uh, has a lot more uh, language requirements than it did when I was a student. Um, and so does the curriculum that we pick have um, appropriate supports for parents and families um, that may not um, speak English or, or read English um, fluently? So I can start, mm -hmm. that's okay. So I think in terms of thank you for the offer of support and certainly summer, uh, we do have plans to do some of that. It's not compulsory for staff, um, but some of our Title IIA and some appropriation funds, uh, that this is gonna be the priority at mm -hmm. the region level. So I think you're right to say that, you know, while well, the school year right now ends June 14th, and Mr. Sullivan will assure me it will continue to do so, right, Ms. Steve? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. shoots very roads will stay clean. Um, One more mic. <laughs> um, it actually offers us an opportunity, frankly, uh, that we don't typically have, given that most staff were not planning on uh, vacation on the 17th of June. Um, so we are actively we're actually talking about this tomorrow morning mm -hmm. with our admin team. Uh, how do we use uh, funds in this year's budget as well as looking at next year, but particularly that we have this, uh, particularly this extra week of time where most staff do not currently have plans to be elsewhere. and. How do we fund pro fund time for them to do PD? So it's in addition to not having as many snow days and the obvious advantages of that, um, there's some actually PD advantages that um, are fortuitous given our timeline. I think on the second front, the life, well, I'll just say for the parent training, this is something that, you know, Dr. Looney, Mr. Sheen and I, and, and Dr. Gramacki, middle school principals talk a lot about that it actually has to be in the calculus of curriculum selection, mm -hmm. that we have to be considering uh, how do parents have access to know what their children are learning how do they have access, not just to the grades via power school, which is one way to think about it, but actually that they can support, and support doesn't mean do the homework with them necessarily, but to be able to have, to know what questions to ask, to understand the philosophy of education their students are receiving, um, that has to be something that we're considering. And frankly, some programs do a better job of that than others, particularly for the diverse range of, of parent learners in our community. You know, to the ELL, you know, I think we could go on uh, even beyond that. Um, and then what kind of training can we offer families about not just a new curriculum, like at a meta level, but actually at a micro level, what are ways that you can support your child uh, in doing that? And that, that's critical. Um, and I think we've, you know, frankly, our programs right now, we see a, a variation between the different levels around that. Um, I think the other thing I want to say, I'm sorry, I'm, no, I hope no. it's okay. The life expectancy of textbooks is a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. So we went through a national phase of revising curriculum standards. So it's a hard question to answer because it kept on changing sort of rapidly on us. And I do think we're at a place now, probably the last thing I should say, I shouldn't make this claim, but <laughs> it feels as if uh, we have math standards that are going to be around for a little while. And one of the things that's been nice at this point is that publishers have responded to that. And um, the number of options that are consistent with the current standards are much more than they were four or five years ago. Um, just if you look at some of the programs we'll be considering, a lot of them were published 2016, 2017. After that standards movement kind of had released its latest version and there's not a huge movement to review that right now. So one of the reasons that textbooks fade isn't just because newer, better things come out, it's that literally the standards that are expected to be taught change and then you have to make adjustments. Um, yeah, so I'll send, save most of my comments for next meeting because um, they're really about the detailed implementation. I think I've, I've spoken about the general issue before about how we support kids that are leaving the IMP curriculum uh, to other math and if there's gaps, how do we support them and not lose sight of that during this very busy time. Um, but I had a statement from uh, our chair who wasn't able to be with us tonight uh, that she asked me to read. Um, so I'll just read it for you. Uh, so as chair of the Amherst School Committee, I think it's important, uh, Mr. Anastasia Ordonez. <laughs> Forgot to mention her name. 
Uh, as chair of the Amherst School Committee, I think it's important to state a few comments and questions for the superintendents and committee's consideration. It's great that the math working group is going to be meeting next week to begin developing a vision for the district and to examine the achievement gap identified by our consultants, especially among our Latino students and high need students. We cannot allow another academic year to pass without addressing this shortcoming, honing in on why it's happening and taking steps to correct the problems. I also think that the placement of a math intervention teacher at arms is a step in the right direction, though I'm concerned that one educator is not enough to fill the very pressing need for increased math support among our students. I hope we're critically assessing how many intervention teachers we need to add in order to be most effective. I think it's imperative that we begin outreach to parents and caregivers about how the math working group is studying the problem more closely and making recommendations and that additional levels of support will be offered for students in the interim until new solutions are put in place. All parents and caregivers should be informed of their options to help support their children. Uh, the report also showed that by the time our students are in sixth grade, there are already serious problems emerging. We must ensure that all elementary schools have trained educators and math specialists on the impacts of uneven math skills among different groups of students and are poised to address the disparities early enough to reduce negative effects by the time students get to middle school and high school. Finally, I am concerned when I hear that work has been done to date on math recovery because the consultant's report points to a decline in the past few years. I would like to hear how the district expects improvements in this area to be undertaken and what evaluation measures will be used to ensure improvement. This last piece is critical. If we, cannot show, if we cannot show that students are doing better in our math program and families and students continue to express such high degrees of frustration, then we're missing the mark. And I'm not referring to standardized testing per se, but instead about a comprehensive approach to improving the math experience for students that involves added support as needed, continued evaluation, including individual and family check-ins and similar approaches. So what steps are we taking to make sure that we are being successful on this front? Scope of work. Uh, how many courses are you selecting a textbook for? I don't have the specific I mean, answer for you. A lot. Sixth grade through <laughs> senior year in high school. Right, and which oh. it gets more complex when you get to ninth grade. Um, six, seven, eight. It's a little bit more contained. High school becomes significantly more complex. And your timeline for achieving this goal is. The goal is, is the timeline that we okay. we provided. So, yes. Just a quick clarification. The, the school committee will have a chance to um, sort of weigh in on the on the different um, textbook sort of mm -hmm. options. Like you're going to be coming back to us with. Okay. Right. So yes. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, before the committee um, might leave to adjourn, uh, item four on our agenda is announcements and public comments. Um, are there any announcements from the committee? Mr. Um, I'll make this very brief because it's really a topic that's more appropriate for, to be unpacked later for advocacy, but um, Ms. Kosinski and I were able to attend the uh, hearing on the education bills at the State House for the, on the Joint Committee of Education. Uh, a lot that went on there, uh, a lot that's very interesting. There's a, uh, a rally planned on May 16th. If people are thinking, what's one date in the future that I can be a part of? May 16th at the State House and also in Springfield will be a rally for the, the Promise Act, which is one of the omnibus bills that addresses uh, many of the issues. Um, just the, the other comment I, 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 would, I would say about the, just thematically is that, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, discussion right now about which type of district would benefit the most. Uh, urbans, rurals, those hit by charter schools, um, those hit by other issues. Um, and, and really, I think the discussion underneath it all is, is about how big should this pie be? Because when we talk about supporting all districts, we're talking about a lot of money and funds. And uh, there's a lot of uh, subtext in positions about whether this, this pie should be as small as it is now or whether we really need something to make that pie bigger. So it's really, an interesting conversation that we can get into more in depth at a right. time. If I could yes. add really quickly to that, there's a rural school aid bill that's having a hearing on April 9th, and while it may not have a large impact on the region, it may have an impact on some of our community towns, um, so that's something that um, might be worth uh, reading and, and or, you know, if the school committee at some point uh, feels it appropriate to provide some, um, you know, resolution that we like both of those bills. Cool. I mean, yes. It's just, uh, I think, uh, what we experienced this year with the rural school, it really depends on how it's calculated. So yes. as you know, the region actually got 
some of the rural aid while our member towns that only were had rural districts did not. <laughs> so uh, I think it is worth including, you know, or, or at least having an assumption that it's possible that the region would be influenced because um, I don't think those other towns, I don't think Leverett and Shootsbury Leverett or Pelham Shootsbury got, received any of that rural aid, whereas the region mm -hmm. did because of those wealth three towns. Factor. Yeah, okay. it's so, a go figure. wealth factor calculation. Yeah. So we still have a public here. I'm grateful. I was worried. I saw while we were going to our announcements, I saw people walking out. And I'm like, <laughs> don't all walk out. You have a time to speak. Uh, so we, we would now love to open it up for public comments if there are any. If there are, please come forward uh, to the microphone, identify yourself. You'd have th up to three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Marla Jamait. Um, I live in South Amherst. I have one child at Crocker Farm and one at the high school. I'm um, sorry that I wasn't here earlier um, for the facilities planning presentation. I just wasn't able to get here early. Um, but I have been participating with the Facilities Use Advisory Board, and I guess I just wanted to come tonight to say um, how exciting I think uh, some of the information is that's coming out um, of those meetings. I'm really very intrigued by some of the options um, for moving the sixth grade um, to the middle school, which is something that I think would really enrich the middle school, um, create a longer grade span and a more meaningful experience um, for <coughs> our, our tweens tweens and young teens, um, that I'm extremely excited about the idea of uh, reuse of a portion of the old machine shop um, as a maker space. I think that you know one of the areas in which many of our children are lacking is on hands-on skills, you know, that they are very proficient when it comes to using uh, phones <laughs> and you know but in terms of being able to build something repair something small um, those are not skills that that they are getting um, in, in their day-to-day -day lives and, and I think it could really enrich uh, the middle school experience I'm, I'm also excited by the prospect of um, a larger and better uh, drama classroom um, at the middle school, which I, I think would be an asset. And um, and I guess I see a real opportunity there um, to, you know, for some improvements at the middle school that could be done in a cost-effective way and really augment um, programs and augment the culture and community um, at that school. So, thank you. Thank you. If there are further public comments, please come forward and just state your name. and. And again, you have up to three minutes. Hi, I'm Deb Leonard. I'm a parent of two high school students and one elementary school student. And I just want to say I'm so thrilled that we're working at this fast pace to, to address the issues, the, the huge need of the, um, the math curriculum. I really uh, appreciate the work that Dr. Morris has done and Mr. Sheehan, and I wholeheartedly, um, I, can't, I can't wait to um, my daughter's 10th grade math experience in the fall, so thank you. Is there further? Hi there, I am uh, Dr. Sandy Madden. I am a uh, mathematics educator in the College of Education at UMass. Um, I'm speaking both as a professor but also as a parent of students here in the, in the district. I have a son who's a junior and I have another son who graduated um, in 2016. I have way too much for three minutes, so um, I'll, maybe I'll have to come back. But I wanted to say that as a mathematics educator, um, I have some serious concerns about the nature of um, the evaluation report that was constructed and, and delivered. Um, when I first received the survey as a parent, I was surprised by some of the questions that were asked and the ways that they were constructed. And as a person who does research in the field, there, there are obvious ramifications for my thinking about this. Um, I've been working in and around mathematics reform for the last, well, 20 years for sure, arguably 10 years before that. So programs like IMP that were developed under the auspices of MSF National Science Foundation funding um, have been remarkable in terms of the opportunities that they've offered to, to engage students in worthwhile mathematical thinking and reasoning and problem solving. And one of the things that we know is that what kids learn about mathematics, or anything for that matter, um, is based on what they have an opportunity to learn. So if you really want your kids to learn how to do mathematics, to be mathematics reasoners and problem solvers, 
and have independent ideas and argue and learn how, <coughs> excuse me, learn how to critique the reasoning of others and all of the things that, that the standards suggest that we want. We have to have curricula that give them the opportunity to do that. IMP is not perfect, but um, when students are engaged well and teachers do high quality work, ambitious practices with students, they're doing mathematics every day. The kind of mathematics that's non-routine, ill-structured, where kids have to put everything that they know into making sense out of um, mathematical ideas and putting forward arguments. And I'll just tell you a little bit, because when I, when I moved my family here in 2008, one of the reasons I did that as a mathematics educator was because, at least on the website, it looked like here was a school district who had some things figured out. They were using investigations at the elementary school level and connected math at the middle school level and IMP at the high school level. And I was like, that's amazing. We could see, tr we could see reform in the elementary and middle schools, but at the high school level, that is, a, that is a tough nut to crack. And so over the course of the last 11 years since I've been here, um, I kind of have stayed out of this conversation. My kids are in schools. I do triage at home as needed, whatever. But, um, but I, I work with pre-service mathematics teachers. I train them. You have some amazing teachers that are so thoughtful and deliberate in their practice. And I'm going to watch something just be swept out in a um, what seems to be a really hasty way to do this work. And I just, I guess I wanted to just say, on behalf of the high school teachers who I've worked with um, and they've taught my children, you, I can't speak for all of them, but the ones with whom I've worked and whom um, have mentored student teachers for me, they are um, extraordinary in the thoughtful ways in which they approach mathematics. And one of the things I would like this committee to consider is the fact that when, when they move to all students having to experience IMP, that was a big deal for this community. And it wasn't received very well. And it might not have rolled out very well. But I want to I wanna suggest one thing that is an important consideration. I talked to Tim Sheehan about this. I met with him a couple weeks ago. And I said, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons why there's such a culture shock at the high school is because what's going on in the middle school is almost diametrically opposed to what has been being asked of high school students. That was not always the case. Um, but before you wholesale change everything around, it's worth looking at a cohesive, coherent mathematics experience that builds processes and content ac across the grade levels. So to the extent that I can be a resource for this group, for the teachers, for whatever, I offer, I offer my services. But I also don't, I would be, uh, I would be sad beyond belief to see something just pushed in here and imposed even on the high school um, in the kind of what feels a little bit haphazard manner that's being suggested. So thank you. Thank you. Are there additional public comments? Hi, Sarah Morton. Hi, we went to high school together. Um, <laughs> um, I want to say I, I lived in Virginia for a while before moving back here, and they have the, um, the elementary schools ending at fifth grade and then the, the sixth through eighth for middle school. And one of the reasons I was really happy to move back here was because the sixth grade was still in the elementary school because I think that age group isn't, they're not quite there yet. They're not to the, I mean, they're, they're, they're tweens, but they're not quite to that young teen level mentally. They're not, so I, uh, that was one reason why I really liked the fact that the sixth grade was still in the elementary school here. So I was just hoping you guys would keep that in consideration when you're deciding what to do with them. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further public comments, we'll close public comment.
uh, that exhausts the agenda for the joint meeting. Um, Mr. Hamill? Uh, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor of the Amherst School Committee adjourning. All right, we are adjourned. I'll take a motion to adjourn, too. I'll move to adjourn the Pound School Committee. A second. All in favor? Would the uh, regional committee like a five minute recess? Yes, yes please. We have a five minute recess by acclamation. Acclamation. Thank you. Uh, the Amherst Pound Regional School Committee is back in session. Uh, on uh, region only topics, the first item of the agenda is approval of minutes of March 12, 2019. I don't know if the committee has had an opportunity to review these minutes in advance. If not, take a moment to do so. I'd entertain a motion. Mr. Demley. I move to approve the minutes of March 12, 2019. Is there a second? second? It's been moved and seconded by Ms. Kosensky. Are there any further edits? Seeing none, all those improving the minutes of March 12, 2019 were signified by raising your hand. It passes unanimously, uh, seven to nothing. The second item on the agenda is subcommittee updates. Are there any subcommittee updates? We've already heard, obviously, about the facilities use committee. Yes. I'll, I'll speak about the policy subcommittee. We're meeting um, <coughs> next Thursday, I believe it is, um, the 4th of April. Um, so we received, um, the last time we talked about policy at this meeting, we wanted a written sort of opinion from our attorneys on the student har student to student harassment policy. Mm -hmm. So we have that. We'll be reviewing that together on, at that uh, committee meeting, as well as there's been significant changes um, in regulations on student discipline, which we'd already wanted to start looking at that policy again. So we are getting some legal opinion on that as well. That will not actually, I don't think, be on our agenda for um, for the fourth, but just to update the committee that that's something that we're going to be looking at and bringing back later. Great. Any, yes? Superintendent Sounds Evaluation good. Subcommittee, I think we have a consensus no. on a date. For Thursday, it's just whether you're going to meet at 5 to 30 or 6, and Mr. Sullivan is the only one who had not been able to weigh in on the time yet. So. Oh, either one. Is there a preference? Lock it down. Lock it down now. I hear 530. 530. What's the difference? <laughs> See, y'all are locked down? Everyone knows? Okay, great. Feels like we've just exhausted item D on our agenda, too, then, possibly. Uh, okay, seeing no other super subcommittee updates, superintendent update, and there's a written update in our packet, right? There is. Or, I, don't, I think it was a separate piece of paper. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's oh, yeah. the stack. Oh, yeah. No, just in case people are looking for it. So I'll be brief to stay with the goal. But um, the first thing, actually, is the one I want to speak to uh, the most, which is, um, and Dr. Brady left, but I just she knows I'm going to acknowledge this, that uh, we had a comprehensive special education audit. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, literally thousands of pages of documents and files were organized, written, collated, organized uh, specifically for a site visit that occurred over a few days. And the last time we had this happen in 2012, 2013, we had four areas that we had to write corrective action plans for. Uh, there was a mid-cycle review three years ago where there was a positive response to that. And that we did not, um, in this one, we have no um, next steps. We have, we have no corrective actions, which is unusual for these reviews because they're looking at so many things. Uh, so I want to acknowledge Dr. Brady and the work of all the special educators. I mean, she ends up doing the share of the organizing, but this is really looking at the work of the, all the special educators across the districts. And I also want to note um, specifically that we had, uh, before the report becomes public, which it is now, um, they have a, at the end of the site visit, they invited Ms. Cunningham and myself uh, and Dr. Brady to a case conference just to share oral feedback and the level of um, Positivity in that case conference was something I usually don't get from DESE auditors. Um, just about, um, yes, miles to go, but doing the right work and seeing steady progress along the way. So I just want to thank all the special educators across the district for their Sir, work. Is there any, I don't know if there's any comment from the committee now, because I mean, it's, I know, I think you, you, you know my mom is a special yes. ed director uh, for decades. <laughs> and so weirdly enough, I've actually heard about this process because it's the kind of thing you talk about when you're visiting for dinner. Uh, and, um, that is extraordinary, yeah. and just and because these are incredibly exhaustive audits when they're done, uh, an enormous amount of work actually on the part of the district to to fulfill the requests and to meet and go over everything. 
Um, so I'd love to hear from the committee. Mr. Demley. Yeah, so um, kind of related to what we were talking about before with the Advocacy Day, I was, I was actually going to speak a, um, as part of a panel on special education funding uh, that got delayed many hours and so I wasn't able to do it. But the theme I was going to talk about is how all funding is education funding and how, you know, strictly from a maximizing academic performance and minimizing cost perspective, it doesn't make sense for a district to, to fund special ed. But we do it because it's the right thing to do. And so when you get real hard, exhaustive data that shows that a district is really doing it well across a broad area, I mean, like, no areas for corrective action, that it just speaks volumes. And, uh, I mean, sometimes we, th we think about special education as, like, this best-kept secret because if we broadcast it too much, then they'll come flocking. You know, it's a real estate therapy is this phrase of people moving to districts that offer special ed well. And um, I just think it's, uh, it's, it's great. I think it's a, it's a real testament to the, the dedication to our staff and, uh, and to the response to the previous audit uh, and the, the continued evolution of our services for our students. So it made me really happy to see these results. Yeah, I'm just say congratulations to Dr. Brady and the entire staff. CPAC, the parents have been Absolutely. super engaged. It's, it's just wonderful. Please continue. Oh, please. Dr. Is there evidence yeah. of people coming to the to the district for help? Uh, we're going to move on. Yeah. We're going to move on. Yep. Uh, please. So uh, I'm going to skip over the second one. I'll just I'll go to the third point, which is the ADA audit update. Um, so uh, back a couple months ago, uh, we had the auditors from KMA um, looking at all of our buildings. They had three public meetings. Weather affected a couple of them, but we did get three meetings in from the community. We had broad representation of administrators and CPAC representatives, and they are getting close to finishing a report, which includes two things. One, a prioritized list based on the feedback they heard, but also, and this was referenced actually in the facilities use report because I shared an early draft because um, it was relevant when they were doing cost estimating of what projects could be done by our facilities maintenance staff. So you're just paying for the cost of items. Example, like a simple example is like signage. That's accessible signage, right? That's something you wouldn't need a consultant to come in for. It's working with a sign company, but our staff could do it as opposed to filling in a well in a library where that's well beyond what our facility staff would be able to manage. So they're both prioritizing but also categorizing, which is um, going to be a helpful synthesis to be involved in, and I believe they feel like they'll have that um, in the next month or so. The timeline at some of the districts are a little different than others based on the capital needs and capital projects, but they are actively in contact with us in finishing that work. Um, the principal search update, so the interviews of the semifinalists identified by the screening committee uh, have been completed. I know uh, Ms. Cunningham updated the committee at the last meeting I wasn't able to be at uh, just about that search process. The last semifinalist was actually today, interviewed today. Um, I've been involved um, in the front end of those as, for, as has been shared in the revised process. So I think in the coming week we'll be able to announce finalists and dates for public engagement and community engagement on that topic. Uh, super fun one. I know some of these, are, you know, like it's fun about the special ed, but this was like authentically fun is that we had uh, a visit from Kanagasaki uh, and uh, Ms. Cunningham and I were able to uh, meet the superintendent who came um, doesn't, isn't usually one of the visitors who comes, but came this time because it was an anniversary year. And um, it, it was just, it was wonderful. I want to thank um, Dee Boyd, Denise Boyd, our middle school guidance counselor, who not just on the school side, but actually for the town side, she's on the town coordinating group and does a tremendous amount. And they really like us, someone to come. You know, it was wonderful that they appreciate the hospitality, but they were saying, if anyone comes, we'll set you up. We'll you know, show you around, you can visit the schools, we'd love to have more of an exchange. So something Ms. Cunningham and I are actually, uh, have been talking about how might we approach that test. It's not close to here, uh, nor is it easily, easy to get to. Even Kanagasaki? Once, but even, it's not like you're right in Tokyo, like it's layers oh, yeah, yeah, and layers yeah. and layers to get to that place. Um, I mean, I know literally I wasn't with crow flies, but. No, I just, <laughs> I, it's like you're making sure people are listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but we really value the partnership. We had a nice conversation about um, just about how the schools operate in Kanagasaki versus here, and it was really nice to have the superintendent here. That's a new experience that I've had. Um, and just two updates on Amherst Media, which is wonderful, as our friend could tell us. Uh, she, she videotaped one of these earlier today, but um, last week we um, what became live was a video on um, athletics in the middle school, high school. So that was athletic director Rich Farrow and Zora Dalman, who's a multi-sport athlete at the high school. Um, and it was really 
quite uh, able to describe um, the student experience of being a student athlete, not just on the competitive wins loss side, but actually how it en enhances her whole experience being a student and certainly how I experienced things in my high school. It's great to hear from her. Um, today we filmed an episode on restorative practices. So that was Evelyn Aquino and Petua Mukimba, so you remember them, and I think it was the December school committee meeting leading a circle, and Petua was uh, a particularly strong leader of the students, and um, so I think that'll be a fantastic episode um, as well. So probably within a week I'll share it again with the committee because it's so relevant to topics that have been discussed at the committee level as well as it'll become live. Um, do you think it was a good one? Yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah, thank you. Um, put you on the spot, I suppose. But, um, but really just talking uh, in a different way than when you're in a circle, but talking about the impact on students and future impact and how they can grow and, and affect the whole school community. Great. So Are there uh, any questions of the superintendent on these items? Sullivan. In honor of Rick Hood, is the student survey going to be done this year? It is. Okay. Yes. Just check it. Yeah. We need those, we need that data. Yeah, the comparative data, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Uh, all right. So, uh, no chairs report. I mean, we, we still have our regional assessment method done. I'm pleased to say. Uh, so on to new and continuing business strategic planning update, Dr. Morris. Yep. And this is truly an update to think about how to frame this out. Um, let's see, I think the update is in the packet. Yep, it is. Um, so I just thought I would go over where we are in process and see if there's any questions. Um, we have three meetings left as a large strategic planning group of you know, roughly 30 people. Um, that includes middle school and high school students, middle school and high school faculty, middle school and high school parents, guardians, and community members without parents, guardians in the school as well as administrators. Um, so it's, it's a big diverse group and that's worked incredibly well. And there's been two phases of work that has um, taken significant amounts of our time. We've met multiple times this winter for two and a half hours at each stretch. We've gotten to know each other in deep ways, which has been a kind of process benefit, I would say, as people wouldn't normally be in the same space talking about the future of our schools. So one uh, phase of our work has been the administrative team, up, team came up with problems of practice that they're recognizing. Uh, for instance, one is about middle school and high school transitions. What's the transition process from six to seven and eight to nine? Um, so the larger group vetted all of those and came up with um, what are underlying factors that, are, that might be contributing to those. That was one phase of work that, that completed a couple meetings ago. The last few meetings have been um, primarily focused on the survey results. So if you remember, there was a survey that went out and is described here with three core questions. And um, so there was an online survey, but there was also members of the planning team literally went out to their communities, whatever that was, whether it was a student going out to a lunch table, uh, community members from different towns going out to their community and gathering feedback. And so we had uh, multiple, I think in total, uh, for all three questions, if you add up every response and all the questions, close to 600 responses for this large group to go through. And we used a formal protocol in small groups to analyze responses to these three questions. And I'll just say the questions out loud since not everyone's here. Um, so question one is project into the future, 2024. Imagine it's five years later. What does the school district or school community look like, sound like, feel like today? So it's asking you to pretend that it's literally the future, not project it will be like. It's, it's imagining what that looks like and then describing what, what's seen, heard, and felt. The second question was from the vantage point of 2024, look back to today, which is this school year, what did it look like in 2018, 2019? And that's asking the uh, people who did the survey or in discussion to really uh, take a more critical look uh, at our current school. Because sometimes if you're only staying where you are, it's hard to be reflective in that mindset. So it's trying to look at, then the third question is, from the vantage point of 2024, looking back, how did the school community become where it is today? So it's really trying to identify who do we want to become who are we now, and what process? What do we need to do to get from where we are now to this kind of more, uh, more fair, just, and um, uh, idyllic future? And so it was incredibly generative. So we went through again 555 responses to these res these questions, these prompts, and uh, through a major coding activity. By coding, I don't mean like computer science coding. What I mean is that coding responses and looking for themes in the data because the the respondents range from age. 12 to a lot older than 12. I'll put it that way. We didn't ask for an age, but we from adults to children uh, and from different parts of our four communities. So what we were trying to do is what themes could emerge from this work. So I'm going to read the, I'm not going to read all the descriptors, but I think I'm going to read the 11 out loud. So the first is physical infrastructure and 
facilities campuses. Uh, I do want to just comment that someone, I think Mr. Demling made a comment earlier tonight that there's been a lot of attention on some of the elementary schools in some of our communities. Uh, it was very clear that people had concerns about the facilities uh, at the secondary schools as well. Mm -hmm. I was actually surprised how often it came up, just personally surprised, mm -hmm. and I'm not speaking for the group, how often it came up, and particularly for students who are aware of some of the shortfalls. The second is the whole student, just thinking not just about the academic sphere. The third is um, our community, and it's really about you know, how our community voice is affecting our district. The fourth is school climate and culture, um, and really think about identities being honored throughout that process. The fifth was curriculum opportunities and academics. Um, and there was a real focus on access to this question, that we want our wide range of academic programs and opportunities to be available to all learners. The sixth was mental health, social, and emotional needs. This came up frequently from all corners, um, all participants. Uh, just concerns about uh, what that looks like and how do we support the development of adolescents um, through what can be a very challenging time period. Seven was this diversity for students, faculty, and staff. So just um, something we've talked a lot about this committee, how do the students demogra student demographics, how are they mirrored or matched at the adult level? Eight, simply put, was money. Because um, again, this are themes that were came up, um, so it's not my terms. Um, but just to make sure that we're not in years where funding um, compromises um, the academic programs, what we offer students, or often hits uh, programs against one another. Nine, race and issues of race. Uh, very clearly, we spent a lot of time with this in the last meeting, is uh, what would it look like if um, issues of race were talked about openly and progress was made on that front? Tenth was seeking action and leadership, um, that it's, it's not just a plan that's developed that looks great on paper, but that actually it's, it's a, a, a guiding document that people would look in the future and say, oh yeah, that's when we decided to take action, not when we decided to write words. Um, so there's a big focus of that. And the last one is that preparing students for the real world, whether that's college or career readiness, that there's some relevancy um, to what students are doing at the secondary level and what they will do after the secondary level. So our work now is to take these 11 themes that came out of our work, uh, out of the feedback from the larger community, take a look at the about 10 or 11 areas that we did uh, that came from the administrators as core issues, and really try to get a sense of what are three to five significant areas of focus that we can do then develop strategies and benchmarks along the way. So we've sort of done the two core phases of the work, which are gathering feedback from the community, looking through themes, understanding from the academic leaders, the building leaders primarily in our district, what are some of the issues they see. And now we have to take those two data sets and work on them and merging them to be one coherent um, process, uh, one coherent product looking forward um, that takes into account our educational leaders, our community members, uh, and really setting a vision for the district. So with three meetings left, we think we can get pretty close to that place, um, and it may involve some work over the summer to fine tune. But I'll say just um, anecdotally or quali qualitatively, it's been an amazing process. Like a lot of strategic planning processes, it feels a slog, like a slog at certain points. And, and that was some of the feedback we got, because every session has feedback for all the participants we're able to share. Uh, this is moving too slowly. Can we get to a product? And then uh, sort of somewhere along the line you forget that you're in a slog because you see that the action of the work um, occurring and this was one of them when you're going through 555 responses it's a slog. there's no way around it it's it's not the most enjoyable work to do but when the themes start emerging and you're talking between different groups who are looking at the same data it does feel very exciting and uh, the last thing I'll say perhaps unless there's question I mean until questions uh, having the student voice has been incredible you know our consultant Dr. Roussad is doing work in other communities and he had an instance this winter where he was in one community the evening before and in Amherst, you know, uh, working in the region the next morning and he said, something feels so different and I can't figure out what it is. He said this at the beginning of the session. At the end of the session, oh, I forgot what it was. It's that, you know, a quarter of the room are students from age 13 to 18 and how that changes the conversation the adults were having just because of the presence and energy that our students are bringing and I think it's a really nice model to think about other areas where we're doing active planning, how can students be an active part of the, active participants in the process, not just because it feels good that we're gathering their voice, but actually it has an influence on all the adults because it reminds <coughs> me, I'll just say from my for self, of, of why we're doing what we're doing. Sometimes it can be a room like this and it's mostly adults and you know it, but you're reminded of it, it's in your face when a quarter of the student, people there are, 
are, are young people who are strongly advocating for what they believe in. So, um, so when when would this committee next engage with this work? So our last meeting that's scheduled, just frankly, because some people are graduating and the end of the year is May 22nd, I believe the date is. And so I think at the school committee after that, we should have a product, or at least the first round of product, a draft product to share with the co committee and then the larger community to gather feedback. Okay, great. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Thank Thanks you so much. Fundraising policy, second reading vote. This, this, I have a question for you that's going to sound really stupid. Yes. Is this the same policy we talked about at our last meeting and we asked the question out loud whether it should go through the policy committee? No, that was the um, designer selection. Um, uh, this did go it. through the policy. No, I, forgive me for doing no, that, okay. but I'm just like, I, I had to ask. Yeah. I didn't bother reading our own minutes to re up for, uh, refresh my memory. Yeah. So the goal of this item is a second reading and possible vote, depending on the feedback from the committee. Um, I'm happy to go through the highlights of it, or if you've read it, just if you have feedback. I have feedback. Um, so on the last page on item four, the sale, raffling, or any form of distribution of alcoholic beverages for the purposes of fundraising is prohibited. Um, do we need to add any other substances to said list now that they are legal in Massachusetts. I'm presuming Doesn't you wouldn't want right? to be raffling off edibles. <laughs> would you, would, would you, uh, I would find uh, that disturbing. <laughs> would you mind putting that in? That's a friendly amendment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I, I do. I, I mean, at one point, things used to say tobacco and alcohol. Tobacco no, no, no. sort of the, fallen I mean, out of phase. The spirit but... of the enterprise would be such that we would be... Uh, I'm uh, just thinking how to cover everything. Do you think putting any substance prohibited on well, school grounds I, would sort of... I think so. I was just looking at our policies to find... I know there's a listing of uh, prohibited things. Yeah. That's not a bad way of handling it. Okay. Because that way it also, for example, prohibit the raffling off of firearms, right. for example. Yeah, no, it covers all those. silly, yeah. but I mean, seriously. Oh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, you just answered my question. Firearms? <laughs> 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 I was going to mention that it's already at the state level that... Um, Certain substances are illegal on school grounds, and so we don't need to re repeat that. But if you wanted to cover that at all, Mr. as Mr. Nakajima said, you could just generically say those things that are already prohibited. Yeah. Even if school the fund, grounds. Right. Even if the fundraising true. happens off of school property. Absolutely. Yes. Right. yes. Right. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Is there, is there a, I mean, it, do we want to come back for a vote on this, or are you good looking to? If, if that's the only change and you're ready to vote, that's, you can vote. Okay. Um, if there's other thoughts or if you want to wait till next time, that's fine too. I'm ready to vote. The, uh, yeah, I think I'm, you know, it's, the only thing that's interesting is I remember when I was reading through this earlier, um, it just struck me, the, the question struck me as to whether or not any of these activities are whether we're setting in place a policy for things that might already be occurring, mm -hmm. or if it'll be something suddenly. I'm just thinking of, you know, yeah. I mean, crowdfunding most of funding for teachers for, you know. Right. Yeah. Most of this is this microphones working really well tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> must be the new one. So. Um, most of this is designed not to prohibit any of the activities that are going on, but just kind of put some guidelines in place as to how they'll operate. Um, you know, for example you know, the crowdfunding, um, some of that happens already, but we're very clear, like, we're not going to give our bank account information out to a, you know, website um, for crowdfunding sources. Not to mean, say that you can't do it if we work with you, but um, the district won't do that. Um, same thing with the charitable fundraising, some of the other things. So, you know, we try to craft it in a way that it didn't squash anything, um, but does allow us to put some safeguards in place. Are you looking for a motion? Sure. I'll like. move to approve the fundraising policy with the addition of prohibited items on school property in addition to alcoholic beverages or instead of alcoholic beverages. Is there a second? So moved and seconded by Mr. Menino. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify. Carries 7 to 0. Thank you. Thank you. 
superintendent goals update, there is a, uh, as a reminder, a copy of <coughs> the goals in here. I think you were going to, I don't know, refresh our memory as well as also discuss some of the work you're doing in preparation or anticipation of evaluation? Yeah, so I, I'll keep this very brief. Um, one of the things that we've done in Pelham, and I want to compliment Ms. Kastensen, I think it was her idea, was just at each meeting, um, try to pick a goal or two to have an update on. Um, so it doesn't feel like it all happens at the end of the year. Um, the reality is, is I, I thought this was a good idea to put on the agenda, and then I looked at the goals, and I was like, well, you've heard a lot about some of those things tonight. So uh, I don't think, I'm not sure it's worth spending more time on this tonight, but I think more as a model or as a process, just it might be worth uh, for the subcommittee to think about um, moving forward, uh, how it can be integrated more regularly into the meeting structure. Uh, I found this year at Pelham, and I'm open to, you know, Mr. Menino and Ms. Kassensen's point of view, that it's been helpful to have a small agenda item where just there's more routine, regular updates, not a PowerPoint, it's not a slide deck, but just um, to update the committee along the way. Uh, we haven't done that at Regent this year, but um, I think it's, it's worked well, at, in my experience, at the Pelham School Committee. Um, so I just wanted to put those goals as at least a prompt to at least have a conversation, start a conversation perhaps to be had at the subcommittee level about uh, how we sort of organize ourselves around the goals that get set in the fall to not wait till May and June to um, be talking about them explicitly. Sure. Appreciate that. Are there comments or thoughts from the committee? It's interesting to me looking at the goals. We, we really, I think with, to some extent with the, with the exception of goal six, yeah. um, we've, we seem to regularly hit on a number of these topics I mean, I, I appreciate the idea of structuring the meeting so that we have the item on there, and that's an interesting suggestion. But I'd also say we seem to hit on, you, you would have to be really not paying attention <laughs> to notice, you know, at least most of these items yeah. being brought up in yeah. substance uh, in our meetings. Uh, okay, but then any, out anything else from the committee on that? Um, for the superintendent evaluation process, I guess the question would be, you already, you just set a meeting time for yourselves to meet. Um, are there any questions that subcommittee has for the rest of the committee on sort of your marching orders? Are you clear on it? And if you are, will let you go on your merry way? I think so. Who's the chair of that committee? We have to re-pick one. Do you want to do it the democratic way and vote yourselves? Or do you want me to pick one? I don't care. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Ms. Kosensky, you're the chair. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sure. Um, I just wanted to make sure it was on your radar. Um, so uh, the Amherst members of this committee now um, roll over in, uh, every two years in, in the fall, but we still have the other members of our committee um, coming up at various times during the spring. Yes. And sometimes it may be that there's a member who's been on for almost all the year, and then they, they come off right before we do the evaluation. And so we've been through who, you know, the, it's clear that you have to be on the committee in order to submit the evaluation. But mm -hmm. in terms of the idea of optimally, is it possible to schedule it before those people, you know, just drop off? We or have a timeline. We have a timeline. We have a timeline. We've looked at it. And thanks to the charter, it makes it significantly more challenging. But <laughs> <laughs> there is a timeline. Excellent. So uh, is it, is it uh, I think this has to be on the agenda for the next meeting. Is that all right? Yes. Cool. It, it's good because that, well, when's our next meeting? Two weeks from tonight. Two weeks from now. April. 12th. 12th. I won't be here. And that might be my last meeting. Town meeting is April 27th. I am not running for re-election. I move that Ms. Kosensky runs for re-election. <laughs> <laughs> come on, second. Uh, come on, a second. <laughs> yeah, come on. The entire town. So, um, I'm not dealing with that last comment okay. you made. Okay. Uh, so our meeting, isn't it the 9th? Could be. I'll be out of town then. I mean, if it's, if it's two weeks from today, <laughs> yeah. wouldn't that have to be like the 9th? Oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. I must have, it is. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, Sorry about that. Yeah, you're right. I'm it is the night. The 6th through the 18th. Too much responsibility. Okay. Well, we st we're st I mean, yeah. forgive me for saying this, we're still going to have to talk about yep. this next week. Yep. <laughs> Even in your absence. <laughs> and then otherwise, we'll just have to, like, we'll have to do a crowdsourcing thing to create more comfortable chairs so that you want to stay. <laughs> Something illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Plus the $50. So, so at the 9th, um, 
the, the uh, superintendent evaluation subcommittee is going to come, and so are, have you. Are you going to have any work completed at that point, or are you? Are you? Are we going to be talking about the work you're going to be doing at that point? What's well, I mean, if they hopefully, I, you tell us. But I mean, hopefully, <laughs> if you've been developing a timeline, we'll get that timeline for one thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we'll know when we're going to be doing everything this spring, and then I think if the superintendent has thoughts on when he's going to be able to deliver. Um, the uh, packet of evidence, or whatever you call it, you know, review materials, that you'll have a sense of when you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. And then the last question I have is just going, I guess I have some, some thoughts on the superintendent evaluation process that I would mm -hmm. love to, so I don't know if maybe then would be the appropriate time to mention those, or Or now. now. Yeah. Like, so this is not necessarily something you can address this time, but I've talked about this at home too. Um, so one of your tasks is to select the, so we, you know, we evaluate on these goals, and then you also select I, uh, elements from the rubric, right, that sort of tie into these. And sometimes that's the part that I find difficult, because I can't just say, yes, this was great because X, Y, Z, I, had, I sort of have to use this language that has already been crafted to try mm -hmm. to sync my own response with. Mm -hmm. And so I always have trouble with this, and I don't know how to. I just think it would be great if over the years, if that's something that the evaluation subcommittee could look at, ways to address that sometimes I feel like it's a disconnect mm -hmm. in the evaluation mm -hmm. process, you know? Yeah. Or sort of understanding like what it, what it physically looks like, if it's, a, if it's a proficient or an exemplary or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So, just throwing that out there as things that I think would be great if that could be considered. Yeah, I think we talked about that at the beginning of this year about um, in an ideal situation when the superintendent um, works with the committee to set the goals at the beginning of the year, we would have a discussion about what the expected output would look like, right? So that we have an under, we can clearly articulate our expectation to the superintendent and the superintendent can then reach for the appropriate understanding of that, of what success looks like. And so that should really happen when you set the goal, right? Like, mm -hmm. here's what I want you to do. And if you do this really well, this is what it looks like. <coughs> yeah, that and sometimes, would be. right. And sometimes it's not even just the, what does the output look like, but sort of how do we use the instrument to... Yeah, right to harness that, I guess, yeah. or thoughts. Yeah, that, which, so. I think, which I think would relate to what are, we, what are we doing that follows the specific structure that uh, DESE provides, and then what are their opportunities for qualitative feedback on the goal that aren't, don't negate <coughs> the response to the specific rubric or whatever, but, but, um, but simply supplement it in a way that, that gives you a more fully dimensional exactly. yeah. response. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think if you're, I mean, to my mind, the conversation we've had a lot about over the last couple of years has been that as imperfect as it is, you're judging based on the goals that were set. And so I wonder about the question of how we can create an instrument that allows us to be as fully responsive and helpful to the superintendent and feedback as possible on the goals that are set and sort of the meaning, in other words, the bright line being around that versus picking whatever the heck we feel like giving feedback on, regardless of whether it was a goal. You know what I mean? So, Mr. Gentleman? Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point. The, the other complication that I had on that same theme when I was doing this last year was um, from the public's perception, the discussion of the superintendent evaluation is really just what marks did he get? You know, and it, it's, become, it's this very high level general thing that that I think really depending on how the year is going and how the relationship is between the school committee and the superintendent um, might be a very visible thing that happens that year. And, uh, and so even though we all understand the very technical wonkiness of, of the rubric and the instrument and the, I can't even remember the terms, of like, and the subdivision of terms, I mean, it's, I think it's an overcomplicated thing that DESE produces. Um, so that's good for our, our internal objectivity, but to sort of then extrapolate this, this lumbering technical structure into expressing, hey, you did a great job this year, or you were really terrible on this, it's, it, it feels too constricting, you know? And so I, I find this tension point between it as, it, 
the practical sort of sometimes political instrument that it is and, and the actual being faithful to the, the technical requirements of it. Well, that's food for thought. Okay. Um, thank you. Accept gifts. I think we actually have a gift, right? Yeah. Oh, very little. We take them of all sizes. That's we appreciate <laughs> every gift we get. <laughs> Ms. Caskinson, do you have a motion? Yes. Um, I will move to accept a gift from Anonymous, your cause, number 5601-736-798 to support the Amherst Regional Middle School at the principal discretion in the amount of $10. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any debate? Seeing no debate, all those in favor? Signify by raising your hand. It's seven to nothing. Uh, in favor and deeply appreciated. Uh, and so the item, the next thing on school committee planning, there's simply, that's a dump list of things we're going to get to and talk to. It's, they're not items for discuss right now, but they're things to let you know. Obviously we've had, I mean it starts off with master facilities use and math follow up and I'm sure we'll hear more about the, the, prin the principal hire and yeah. things like that. So there's a known list of things. Um, I think what we're going to, there's been some discussion about having it, this is going to sound really convoluted, a discussion about having a discussion <laughs> about early start time. And so I think in a near meeting, we will have a discussion about a discussion on early start time. What that, uh, to unpack that, what that means is um, it would be welcome for the superintendent to help the committee think about mm -hmm. if the committee wishes to engage on this topic as a, as a in other words, th this isn't a circle where we just, this isn't a book club. We read a book and we sit and talk about stuff. Ideally, we talk about things so that we can act upon them or provide feedback for action. So there are lots of really important topics we could talk about, and they're very they're genuinely valuable. They're like really important things to talk about. Um, but the question is, do we want to talk about something to do something about it? Um, and so, not to belabor it. So the bottom line is, <laughs> what we want to do is we want to have an item on a near term that's been requested, and I think this has been talked about a bit to get from the superintendent some sort of framing about what it would look yeah. like to address the topic and then have an item where the committee can talk about what it thinks. One suggestion. Yes. Um, so this has been discussed before, yeah. right? And there were some roadblocks that were discussed and I think it would be really helpful to understand what those roadblocks were, to understand if any of them, if, we've been, if, if time has allowed us to work around any of them. Through we, over or, or the way they've dissolved. Right. Like snow. Because if there's still really a true roadblock there, then I... Well, that's part, I think that's part of the context yeah. that the superintendent would provide. Yeah. Is there So my impression that Boston has moved to the earlier start time. Is there any way we can find out the results of their experience? More framing from the superintendent to look into. <laughs> Yes, Mr. There's, um, the MASC is putting on a workshop, yeah. um, a two-part workshop on specifically this topic, and I actually signed up to go to the second part of it. Thank you. Cool. Um, I forget. I so saw that notice. When is that? April. 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 It's the Saturday after our next Okay, so meeting. we'll put this on the agenda after yeah. April 9th, <laughs> which will then allow you to speak to this item when it's on the sure. agenda. Sounds kind of cool. Uh, I feel like we're getting organized. I know. Is there anything else you want to mention about our school committee planning, not about this item? So, about that yeah, point. I won't comment on the item. So, what I thought I heard from Ms. Kaczynski was this potentially her last regional meeting, so I just want to acknowledge, I know other, her Is this really your last well. regional meeting? Really? That's what I thought I heard. Yeah. So, um, unless, wow. you know, unless I don't show up to town meeting and they vote me back on in, in my absence, but I'm, I'm really planning on being there on the 27th <laughs> to prevent that from happening again. Um, <laughs> So I just want to share that just I've really appreciated um, the work and, and just you know, talking about superintendent evaluation process, not just the process piece, but the feedback piece that I've received from you over the last few years. It's been incredibly valuable. And the number of uh, phone calls while watching children <laughs> trying to plan for four town meetings and subsequent other meetings around the regional assessment methodology, not just this year, but in past years. Um, is, I'm taking out some highlights, but I just I think they're worth noting the highlights because they've had a huge impact on our, our district. So I just thank you for your service and thank wish you. you the best on your Tuesday nights to come. Yeah. And yeah. Monday, what, Tuesday nights, Monday nights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you've made absolutely exceptional contributions to the committee uh, that, are, that hopefully are well known to the people of Leverett. 
and hopefully well known to the people of Amherst and Pelham and Shutesburg. Yeah, it, it, but you've it's been actually great. been very pleasurable, and I, you know, it's really just a time commitment thing with with work and children at home. It's challenging, so we're gonna miss. Maybe you. I'll be back someday. <laughs> Maybe next month. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, that's that, that's sad to end, but um, we have to. Is there is there a move to adjourn? I'll move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Gusinski <laughs> moved to adjourn at her last meeting. Uh, Ms. McDonald seconded. All those in favor? It carries unanimously. We are adjourned. <laughs>